check this morning. Go ahead and say that.
there's sufficient evidence to corroborate his testimony in this case. Uh, and because there's not sufficient evidence to corroborate his testimony in regards to um, specifically the, the murder case and the, the, the tampering case, Your Honor, uh, we would ask that a uh, motion for director be granted. Director Hurd, for, I did not hear you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, with regard to your motion in the tampering case, that is denied. However, in the murder case, it is, it is alleged in the indictment that uh, Lisa Jo Dykes, on or about the fifth day of October 2020 in the county of Dallas, the state of Texas did, et cetera, et cetera, cause the death of Mary Ellen Rotella Valadez, and after called deceased by stabbing deceased with a knife, a sharp object, a deadly weapon. The indictment goes on to say, and by a manner unknown to the grand jury, using a deadly weapon, unknowable to the grand jury, a deadly weapon. What says the state? Those would both be in the conjunctive that there would be the state would have to prove either one of those manner and means that are alleged in the indictment. We have sufficient evidence that's been before the court and before the jury as to each and every one of the elements, uh, specifically found with the manner and means. Um, as to, photo, as to uh, the argument about uh, accomplice testimony, the, the law no, doesn't... No, we're not moving on to that yet. The court has not heard any testimony that there was uh, a deadly weapon unknowable to the grand jury or in, in that the death occurred in a manner unknown to the grand jury. Yes, Your Honor, we could abandon those um, aspects of the indictments. All right, so you are abandoning the language and by a manner unknown to the grand jury using a deadly weapon unknowable to the grand jury, a deadly weapon. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. I am striking that language from the indictment in both paragraphs. Right. So the indictment and the evidence before the court uh, regarding
Anything else from the state? Nothing for the state, no. All right, then we are ready for the jury. Mr. Uh, Harris, do you have any, any witnesses to call? Yes, uh, we call Detective Romero. Is she available? She's in the that's right. All right, thank you. Christine Ramirez. And Ms. Ramirez, how, how are you employed? With the city of Dallas Police Department. And how long have you been employed as, as a police officer with the city of Dallas? Maybe 27 or 28 years in March. 28 years? Yes. All right, and in that 28 years, uh, one of the positions you held was a uh, lead detective on, uh, I guess, this uh, murder case. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, I specifically want to talk to you about uh, this case and, and, and your investigation of the case and uh, the manner and means in which you obtained the probable cause affidavit uh, to arrest Ms. Dykes, uh, Nina Morano, and uh, Charles Beltran. Uh, you did obtain arrest warrants in those cases, correct? Yes, we did. And uh, also search warrants to search their phones, correct? Yes, we did. And that's based on information that you gathered during uh, the investigation of uh, Ms. Patello's murder, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, all right, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, when you were assigned this case, uh, uh, what unit were you in at that time? Excuse me? When you initially were assigned the case, what unit were you in? Special Investigations Unit. All right, and what did you do in the Special Investigations 
investigate officer-involved shootings, special investigations, um, dealing with um, cold cases. Okay. So was this considered a cold case? It wasn't an officer-involved shooting? No, it was a special investigations case. And that's how you Endangered um, uh, person when suspected foul play is actually. Because when you first got the case, uh, there was no evidence that uh, Marcello was dead, correct? When you first were assigned the case? Correct. And it's still a missing person's case? Endangered person, missing oh, person. Right, because there's a difference, right? Yes. And explain that to the members of the jury. Missing person is someone who has not been seen or located uh, during a certain period of time, and then after family are concerned where they have not seen the family or suspicion suspicion of foul play has actually occurred, then they will actually uh, classify that as uh, endangered person, missing okay. person. In this case, uh, what was the suspicion of foul play? Due to the information that I received from the previous detective. And what was that? That uh, there was um, records where it indicated that the complainant was not in uh, in her hometown, Seattle. Uh, she was here visiting in Dallas. Um, a lift report showed that she was at a um, an establishment in Deep Ellum, and that uh, phone records showed that she was uh, no longer there, but had proceeded elsewhere to a 7-Eleven store, and then from that point to a home in Mesquite. And then from that location, there was no other phone records that I can recall uh, from Ms. Patel, the, com the complainant. Okay, but the person, it was known at that time that the person that she was with at the 7-Eleven was Charles Belton, correct? At the time, well, he was in, uh, as person, person, person of interest. Right, I mean, yes. he's just a person of interest, but you're looking because you want to talk to the person that we see her on the 7-Eleven with, right? Yes. Uh, and there was a vehicle also involved. Um, and just so we're clear, let me show you what's marked as defense exhibit number one. This is the... Um, like a screenshot from the surveillance camera at 7-Eleven, right? Correct. Where we would have saw uh, Maricello and a person that was later found to be uh, Charles Beltran. Correct. All right. Now, at some point, Continue your investigation, correct? Yes, sir. And y'all end up at that house in Mesquite. Well, the previous, if you're talking about the beginning, what, or when I actually took place, when I actually started the investigation. What, okay, yeah. What, what, what do you mean the previous? Well, the previous detective that was actually. And who was that? Uh, Dalby. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and what did Dalby do? My understanding is that they were out there in the ski. They were in the ski. Mm -hmm. But I can't give you the exact details because I wasn't there, <laughs> other than what I was told or okay, information well, well, to tell, tell us what happened once you took over the investigation, what you did. During that time, we reviewed everything that was given from that detective, and then whatever uh, identification type of links that would actually give us to a specific car, um, a phone number, contact, social media, whatever information we can get to find out who this uh, uh, Beltran person was at. Because when you're, you're referring to the car uh, on the 7-Eleven uh, surveillance videos, uh, we knew that it was a black Audi, right? We knew it was a black vehicle until later registration popped up where it showed to be an, an Audi with a license plate. And the black Audi registered to Mr. Beltran and Ms. Dice? Yes. Based on that, y'all were able to get the Kensington address? Yes. And then you got a search warrant for that location, right? Yes. All right. 
Um, were you present during the search warrant? Yes. At some point after y'all searched that location, uh, what happened? They, uh, when the, is it the uh, crime scene investigator, you know, uh, I was asked, I asked him to actually, um, what do you call it? Um, I can't remember the blue star, it's a, a chemical reaction. So I wanted that to be sprayed among the whole uh, house, you know, and from that point, that's where we found uh, that there was some type of uh, possibly blood that was in the, in one of the rooms and they actually tore it up, you know, uh, uh, I mean, not tore it up, but removed it uh, like they did to actually have it for testing. Okay, that's, so let's go back. So what does the blue star do? It's a chemical reaction to blood. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert on it, so I can't mm -hmm. really testify really on to that, but I know it, it, it my understanding is get the protein from the blood to actually determine if, you know, that there was actually blood, human blood in the... Uh, and, and so even if you try to wipe it up... From the top, yeah. The, the blue star is going to detect that blood. It'll right. change color because that's they actually did the testing prior to, and then when it changed color, um, it was it turned to a purple, if I was mistaken. Mm -hmm. And you had them do the whole house? Yes, as far as most, most of the house. Once we... Uh, there are some stains in the house that we noticed, so for sure we made sure that those were actually spot checked. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm gonna get right to the point. In reference to the arrest warrant that you swore to, um, there's a lot of information in there, like for example, talking about the blood, mm -hmm. uh, you indicated in the arrest warrant that Marcella's blood was found and that there was a female and a male blood that was found that you believe belonged to Charles Bertrand, uh, Lisa Dykes, and Nina Moreno, right? If I'm not mistaken, it's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what you told the judge you, you believed, right? Yes. But that wasn't true, was it? Like I said, it's a, it's a probable cause, so it probably happened. So it's not a a confirmed statement, it's a probable cause statement. My question, my, my, my question to you is, when you make the statement, well, well, my question to you is, the blood that was found in the bedroom did belong to Marcel, right? Yes, after we got the DNA, correct. But it did not belong to Lisa Dykes, Nina Moreno, nor Charles Beltran, right? At that point, we did not know, because we didn't have their DNA to actually tested on. Do you know now? Based that on that what? Blood? Pardon? Do you know now for a fact that the DNA on whatever blood that was found in Mr. Beltran's room did not belong to Charles Beltran? Correct. Did not belong to Lisa Moreno? Lisa. I mean Lisa Dykes? Correct. Did not belong to Nina Moreno? Correct. So you were wrong. Like I said, it was reason, it was probable cause at the time. No. Right now, it, of course, I mean, the DNA, of course, is going to show who actually DNA is actually belongs to that blood. Ma'am, I'm not saying you didn't believe it. I'm just saying you were wrong. That okay. blood didn't belong to those people, did it? Correct. So you were wrong. Correct. Uh, there was a hair sample inside the um, alley. Remember yes. that? Yes. And you believe that hair sample belonged to Marcella, didn't you? Based on matching, yes. Matching the description of a, a dark hair, long hair. But it didn't, did it? No. You were I wrong. Correct. You were wrong, correct? Based on evidence, correct. Okay. Um, you also indicated that in the Audi, that there was uh, concrete. What, what did you say about the concrete? That it was similar to the concrete that was out uh, in the Wilmer area? There was concrete found in the vehicle um, based on the phone records that we got initially uh, showed that the vehicle or the suspect vehicle was actually at a concrete place. So we actually went to the location to actually see where the target um, cell phone records, I'm not really 
I'm sorry, not a real good record, but uh, showed that it was an, at a concrete firm. So we actually went out there and saw that there was concrete. And based on that, that's why um, we, based on the information we had, that the uh, Audi had a actual cement on their, I think it was the, I think the rear tire, if I'm not mistaken, I would have to check on the record. But that's the Audi, right? Yes. And um, you're saying that you believe that that car would have gone out to that location on October the 5th, right? Well, we know that the phone, we know which car it was, but we know that vehicle was actually, was Beltrons and these are dykes. Well, I mean, in your investigation, isn't it true that uh, Mr. Beltran, when he left the Mesquite location on October the 5th, he left in the Audi, did he? I don't know what vehicle he actually left in, unless so they see you're it. you're the lead detective in this case, and you're telling the members of the jury that you don't know which vehicle he left Mesquite in that morning. Well, I know the vehicle was a black vehicle that was taken to a um, oil change place, and it had Beltran's name on it. Because Mr. Beltran, on the fifth, took that vehicle to the oil change place, right? I suppose so, yes, sir. Because on October the fifth, Charles Beltran is driving the black Audi, isn't he? According to that, yes, sir. to um, Yes, sir. I mean, you are the lead detective, right? Correct. And it's your responsibility to make sure that any evidence that is collected in regards to the investigation of this case uh, is maintained, correct? Yes, sir. All right. But you didn't do that in this case, did you? What are you referring to? I'm referring to all the evidence that was destroyed in this case. They never got to the defense. That's what I'm referring to. Nothing was destroyed. I did not destroy anything. I'm not saying you destroyed it, but you know you didn't save it properly, did you? There was evidence that was, was not saved properly in this That case. was not under my watch. Okay, well, well you're the lead detective. Correct. Right? When these officers store that evidence, you're supposed to make sure it gets stored properly, right? They are responsible to citing the correct case number, whatever the case may be, would be an investigation, arrest, or whatever it is. They are responsible for saving that, and then from that from that information, then I look into it to make sure we have it. And um, if that particular case, I did not have it. I asked uh, Detective Dalby, and he did not have those uh, uh, videos that you're referring to. Ma'am, isn't it true uh, that during the time you were investigating this case, going from state to state, uh, trying to locate witnesses? Uh, trying to figure out what happened to uh, Mrs. Patello. Um, you also had some personal issues you were dealing with, didn't you? Yes, sir. That directly impacted this case, correct? What are you referring to, sir? I mean, this one thing is you, you testified before you dropped the ball on this case. Didn't yes. You? So there was evidence that the defense could have used that could have aided in our defense that we didn't get. Everything was corrected before this trial started. Where's the, where's the body cam video of uh, Ms. Floyd's interview with Mr. Haynes? Who? Is it the second? Officer, Officer Hayes. Do you remember Officer Hayes talking to a security guard that claimed that he would have saw Ms. Botello uh, out near the Mustang Inn on, uh, on or about October the 12th? 
real estate, you know, because that wasn't Miss Botello. It was a, a tip that we got, but it wasn't her. How, how'd you confirm it wasn't her? Because it was, we couldn't find her. I mean, he wasn't, um, I can't remember what it was. Did you talk to Mr. Mitchell? Did you talk to Floyd Mitchell, the security guard out there? I did not. Because you didn't have the information? I know the, I know we received the tip through social media. We had so many tips coming in at, at, at many times, and um, if I'm mistaken, I know uh, the other detective actually would get tips as well, and you would follow up on them. But I just don't know if I'm mistaken with another case. I'm sorry. What do you mean you had too many tips? Well, people would call all the time. People that on social media. They would just call them and give their you know their information and, and and some of the information we just followed up to see if there's anything but and some of it you followed up on some of it you didn't is that what you're telling them to the jury? Uh, well no it's some of the information was leadable to actually follow up some was just information that they would say that they would make assumptions you know and that's how the cases would be or the tips would be but i'm specifically talking about can you, do you have the report or something I can refer to so I can see what it is so I won't misspeak? You know the you know the report I'm referring to, right? With uh, Officer Hayes. I just remember you said something about uh, Mustang Inn. I know they were looking for someone there at that location, but I'm not sure if that's the one you're referring to. I have to refer what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Okay. It was marked as defense exhibit number eight and ask you to uh, just take your time and review that document.
Yes. Okay. And so as the lead detective in this case, uh, did you ever personally talk to Officer Hayes? No. Based on that report, it states that Botella was there two weeks prior, and there's no record to indicate that she was there. Well, I mean, the, guy, the, the two guys that he talked, he talked to two guys, didn't he? He talked to um, William Brown and Octavius Brown, right? And, and they indicated that they thought they saw her a couple of weeks ago, right? Yes. All right, well, this is October the 13th. Yes. All right? But again, they saw someone two weeks ago who was not Botello because she was not in Dallas during that time frame, sir. Ma'am, they said a couple of weeks. They didn't specifically say 14 days. They just said approximately a couple of weeks. But that report is on October the 5th. No. Am I approaching it? Yes. It's a report on the 5th. Yeah, but I'm saying he talked to them on the 13th, October the 13th. No, yes, he, he talked to them, but here it says that Yeah, that's the officer stating that because she came on the fifth. Right. So, so what you're saying is the officer saying because she came on the fifth, they're saying he talked to them on the thirteenth. You know, he's basically saying, well, that's not that's not fourteen days. So, no way they could have seen him. No word. Let me see. Where is it? I just saw it. Yeah, because they said they, that she likes to hang out over there at the, at the Mustang Inn. Right, that's what Brown was saying, mm -hmm. right? Yes. All right, but the bottom line is, what I'm saying is they didn't say 14 days ago, they just said a couple of weeks. They were estimating, right? Correct. But regardless, did you ever talk to Octavius Brown or William Brown about what they seen as a lead detective in this missing persons case? I'm trying to remember if I actually, myself or the other detective who was working with me, called or made attempts. I, I don't remember. Okay. What about um, after he talked to, after Detective, or after Officer Hayes talked to um, the Browns, they led him to the city, right? According to the report. They what? They led him to, they, told, they led him over to the city, right? Mustang in. Is that what you're saying? Right, because he, he started the city in with those guys, right? No, these guys are at the Mustang Inn, right? Mm -hmm. And then, for whatever reason, and I'll talk to Officer Hayes about it, he ends up at the Mustang Inn. Yes. Where he talks to yet another witness, who's actually a security guard over there, right? Yes, sir. And that person says that he saw her. He shows him a picture, and that person says, yeah, I saw her on the 12th, right? According to this, yes, sir. All right, and what I want to know is, did you talk to that security guard about? I personally did not. And you'll agree with me that the conversation between Officer Hayes and the security guard and the Browns would have all been recorded on a uh, body cam. Yes. But we don't have that body cam, do we? No. Okay. And that's because for whatever reason it wasn't saved, right? What case number do you have for that? On that report? When, it, when a video was recorded or actually downloaded and for them to actually um, save it, it has to be the correct either incident number or the case number. Okay, sh here it shows the case number. Um, and then, again, it just depends on, on the officer. And if it's not typed correctly, then when I retrieve it or try to retrieve it, I may or may not get it. Okay, but, but what I'm getting at, uh, 
Detective Ramirez. Yes, sir. Is Officer Hayes would have shown not only the Browns, but the security guard a photo of Marcella, correct? If they showed him, yes. That's what that's what the, his mm -hmm. report says. Yes. And him showing that photo of Maricela would have been recorded on a body cam had it been saved properly, correct? Yes, sir. And then the members of the jury could determine for themselves whether or not Mr. Mitchell and the Browns appeared to really recognize this girl. Yes, sir. But we don't have that evidence, do we? No, sir. In regards to whose fault it is, we don't have that evidence, do we? No, sir. <laughs> and you're saying you never talked to, to Mr. Mitchell because I guess it wasn't probably stored. Or you just disregarded because it didn't fit your theory of the case. Did you understand my question? Yes, I was trying to so process. All, I guess what I'm getting at is all these tips that came in, if it didn't fit your theory of the case, you didn't follow up on it, did you? No, well, the information I received was not, what do you call it, did not link to what he's referring to. Well, but you, you didn't check. You didn't talk to Mitchell. You didn't talk to the Browns. You're the lead detective on the murder case, and you didn't talk to these witnesses. Correct? I don't recall. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, as far as the uh, video at the Reno location where you had another patron that claimed that they thought they might have seen Marcel. What, if anything, did you do? Now I understand the FBI was involved, but what, if anything, did you do to follow up on that to try to figure out who this patron was? Which uh, place you are you referring to? The Reno bar that was downtown, or in a deep element, where, remember them looking at a video that they said they, they couldn't tell whether it was her or not? Just if you remember, do you remember that? I'm trying to remember. Ma'am? I'm trying to remember. I showed you uh, the FBI, I guess, uh, is that Page? Do you know who Taylor Page is? Yes. All Do you remember what uh, uh, Mr. Page emailed you about uh, the Reno bar? No, can I see the email? Okay. Does this appear to be the email he, he, he sent you? that you reference the highlighted portion here. Mm -hmm.
Yes. Okay, and all I'm asking is I understand that um, they concluded that they couldn't tell whether it was her or not, but what I want to know is did you follow up on it? Well, we did. We didn't, could not have any um, videos because it was already after the fact. When I got the case was in December, and when this happened, uh, it was in October. So a lot of the video that we got was from either family members that came from Seattle to actually retrieve videos of what they had. So even this actual video uh, that they're referencing, we don't have, right? Uh, no. Ma'am? I don't think so, no. Okay. I mean, you haven't seen it, right? No, I have not. I know. You, because you haven't seen it, you weren't able to turn it over to the state for them to turn it over to us, right? Correct. Where did I meet him? Yeah, you went to Utah, right? Yes, sir. He was in jail, right? Yes, sir. And you interviewed him there, right? Yes, sir. All right, let's talk about that. Um, and specifically, when you went to interview uh, Mr. Beltron, he was a, at that time, y'all put out a, a capital murder warrant, right? Yes, sir. And he was picked up on a capital murder warrant. Yes. Uh, And is it safe to say that initially all three people were charged with capital murder because y'all suspected that Mrs. Botello may have not gone with them willingly, correct? Correct. That's why y'all did capital murder. Yes, sir. Okay, but when you initially talked to Mr. Beltran, uh, he was willing to talk to you, right? Yes. He yes. waived his Miranda rights. Yes, he did. Talked to you and uh, Detective Ortiz. Correct. All right. And what did he tell you at first? He didn't know anything. He told you that he, that he, had, left her, he had left her at a garage or gas station or something like that. Right. But you were asking him uh, specific questions, correct? Yes. Uh, you remember him telling you that uh, that they had went to his car? Yes. Uh, they smoked? Yes. All right. Uh, but as far as uh, any sex in his car, he told you they didn't have sex in the car. Correct. Right? Correct. Because you specifically asked him that, right? Yes. <laughs> but you know from other witnesses in this case, he indicated to them that they had sex in the car, right? Correct. That she willingly had sex with him in the car. And then they went to the mosquito. That's what other witnesses said. Well, that... They what? went to the 7-Eleven and then to mosquito. Okay, like that said that he told him that um, they had sex in the car and then he dropped her off, right? Yes. All right. But we know that was a lie because we have him going to mosquito. Correct. Her phone going to mosquito. Yes. Uh, but as far as you were concerned, he told you they never had sex in the car. Correct. But he did admit to you that they were drinking. They took two shots at the house and smoked weed in, weed in the car. Okay. All right. And I want to talk about the first version he gave you. You recall him saying they went to the house, then they, I mean, they were at his car, they went to the house, uh, they drank a little and had sex. Uh, she passed out. I let her sleep and I went in the studio. And he fell asleep on the pool time. Yes, that's what he said. And when he's telling you this, I mean, he's not stumbling. I mean, he's trying to be as convincing as possible, right? Yes, he, he was being, he was talking to me. He was being cooperative. And telling you that he passed out uh, he says he went to sleep on the pool time, right? Yes, he did say that. Uh, he ended up passing out because he was fucked up. Remember telling you that? I remember F word, but he was crashed out. He crashed out. 
Now, I asked you to listen to your video. Yes, but I can't remember. Video, but, so you don't remember him saying I just remember he said he did pass out on the futon. Because he was fucked up. Okay. But you don't remember that part? I don't, remember. Do. I don't remember the F word. I mean, I don't remember if he said that or not, but I know he crashed on, this, on the well, time. remember he said he woke up and everybody was gone? Yes, he did say that. Nina and Lisa were gone. Maricela was gone. He thought she took the Uber, right? Correct. And when he's telling you this, he's not stuttering. He's being as convincing as possible, isn't he? He's talking. I mean, he's trying to convince you that that's what happened, right? Right. That he doesn't know anything. Correct. And he said he wanted to call to check on her, but he didn't have her number, right? Correct. And he also said he kept calling Nina and Lisa, but they wouldn't answer. Correct. So he went back to uh, Dax's place uh, down in Deep Ellum. I think he met him in Deep Ellum. Dax? Yes. In well, he did, he did go to, yeah, correct. Well, in fact, he led you to believe that he was with Dax that whole next day, right? The, the day when it happened? It was that night. On October the 5th. Right. He that you, evening. Other than in the early morning hours, yes. when he was obviously with Marcella, he's saying after he left Mesquite, he went back to Deep Ellum and hung out with Dex. I'm talking about in the first and there, Okay, I'm, not, I'm thinking about the, other, the third one. Okay. No, yes, he said he was with his friend. In the first version? Yes. Didn't say anything about going to Carmen's apartment, right? Right, he did not. Uh, because had he told you he went to Carmen's apartment after being in contact with Maricela, uh, you guys would have went to Carmen's apartment, right? What's Carmen's last name? Carmen was his girlfriend, that's what he told you. Yeah, I'm trying to... You never even met with Carmen, did you? Oh, but is that her? I'm trying to... Carmen is a girl that's supposed to be from Australia. It's girlfriend. Yes, yeah, she was out of town. She was no longer in Dallas. She we didn't probably have, we left Dallas, right? Yes. But, more importantly, at some point in one of these versions, mm -hmm. the, I think it may have been the final version, after he's putting everything on Lisa, he tells you he goes to Carmen's apartment. Doesn't he? Yes, he does. And... You guys don't talk to Carmen, do you? No. Y'all don't find out what apart where her apartment is, do you? No, we try to get help with the FBI to locate her. Okay, but as we far as the, her apartment is what I'm talking about, no. you got Mr. Beltron having contact with a missing person, admitting that he went to this apartment, and we do nothing to check to see if there's any indication that Maricello also was at that apartment, do you? No, sir. They don't blue star that apartment, do they? No. But we know he went to that apartment on that day, if you were to believe him, right? According, yes, according to him. And you never talked to Carmen because she disappeared, right? Correct. You asked him if uh, Maricela was intoxicated. He told you she wasn't, right? Right. Said she was cool. Yes. Right. Said the only thing that happened in the car is that they just chopped it up in the car, right? Yes. They, said they, they just talked and, and smoked weed. Yes. And then you try to pin him down in regards to what time he would have left. I mean, uh, that, uh, I guess, deep Ellum area, going back to Mesquite, he really wasn't sure, was he? Correct. Okay. And do you remember specifically asking him about uh, where Nina and Lisa were when he got to the house? He said they were, they were in the bed, in the room. He said they were in the bed asleep, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And in his first version, he said they never came out of the room. 
Remember that? Yes. Yes. Okay. They, meaning Lisa and Nina, never came out of their room. In one of the stories, he did say that. Okay. Uh, he told you uh, he woke up, his bed was clean, his room was clean. He thought that uh, Marcella just took an Uber, right? Yes. Oh, uh, you remember him talking about that studio and how him and the guys would always sleep in the studio? Yes. So the fact that he had more than uh, just, you know, one or two women over there, um, he made it clear to you that he had friends come over at times. Yes. And they'd be in the studio recording. Yes. Uh, he told y'all that he didn't wake up till about what time? Do you remember? In that first story. I don't remember. And he said he didn't wake up till he didn't get up. He was late noon. noon, yes. No, I remember, yes. And he didn't say that. Y'all knew that was a lie because you already had the all change information, right? Yes. But he said due to the trip, he, he, he was sleeping and he didn't get up to noon, right? Correct. And then he went about his day. Remember that? Yes. And because you already had information that he was with Madeline, you asked him, uh, were you with a friend? Well, you asked him, uh, did you go see a, a, another friend? Or you asked him, did you go see a friend? And he told you, no, he was with that, right? In that first version. Yeah, he had different versions, so uh, I may have asked him. Okay. And as far as uh, Lisa was concerned, remember asking him if he was intimate with Lisa? Yes. And he told you no, right? Yes. That all, all Lisa was was uh, saw the, his potential, right? Yes. In fact, he kind of got ugly with it when you kind of pressed him on being intimate with Lisa. He was like, uh, have you now uh, look at Lisa? Like, I would never sleep with an older woman like that, right? Yes, he said that. Mm -hmm. At some point you told her that uh, Marcella was dead. You remember that? Yes, sir. And you know he knew more, right? Yes. And at that point, after he finished that first version, um, you made it clear to him this is the only time he's going to get the chance to talk to y'all, right? Yes. And uh, those are basically interrogation techniques that y'all use. Would you agree with that? Yes. Let them know, look, you better talk to us now. If you don't talk to us now, you know, you're not going to be able to help yourself later. Correct. Right? So y'all kind of went through that, right? Yes. You remember telling them that uh, he needs to go ahead and talk to you because if something else comes out, uh, he's going to look bad. Remember that? Yes. And this is all before he goes into any version where Lisa is supposed to stab Marcella, right? Correct. Up to this point, he hadn't said anything about Lisa stabbing Marcella, right? No. Uh, you remember Ortiz specifically asked him, hey, you're a felon, right? Yes. Sir. And then that's when he tells him, well, this is capital murder. You can get life without parole, right? Remember that? Yes. All the death penalty. Correct. Asking him, 
them about um, were there times when you brought the girls over and Lisa would get mad? Yes. And, and that's before he started talking about Lisa being jealous, right? I just remember he, he said he was jealous. Ma'am? I remember him saying that she would get jealous or get yeah. mad. After you yeah. said, has there been times when you brought girls over and Lisa would get mad? Correct. Then he started talking about Lisa being jealous, right? Yes. And at this point, you specifically ask him, uh, did anyone get hurt? Yes. Was there any blood in that room? Yes. And he says no, right? Yes. He emphatically says no. Correct. You even asked him if there was a fight, and he said no. Correct. But he did tell you that so many people come through there, right? Yes. But he doesn't know. Correct. Asked him, had he been hurt? Correct. That night, and he said no. He right? said no. Then you specifically ask him about uh, if there's anything that happened in that room where blood would have penetrated the car. Yes, I asked him. And he said no. Correct. And then at one point, uh, you finally asked him, um, are you told him that Marcella's blood was in that room? And you asked him what his explanation was, right? Yes. And what was his response? I think he said he didn't remember. Ma'am? I don't remember. I mean, okay. I'm sorry. I don't remember it verbatim. But you also told him that you found his blood in the room. Yes. Which Marcelo brought, right? Yes, I told him that. And that wasn't true, was it? Correct. Then you start uh, kind of going into well, if it was a mistake, uh, if you were doped up, and you don't remember, just just tell me, right? Correct. And he still was emphatic that nothing happened, right? Correct. Correct. And that's when you said, "Don't let these girls put this on you." You remember telling him that? And where we told him that, to referring to the uh, Lisa and Miss Morano. All right. Don't let them put it on you. That would be unfair, right? Correct. And you even told him, uh, I need to know what happened, because uh, you're going down and they're going to be laughing at you. Yes, they said that. Mm -hmm. Then you asked him about the last time they spoke with him, you remember that? Yes. And he said it could have been two or three weeks. Yes. And y'all also kept telling them, uh, look, we know, when we ask you these questions, we already know the answers. Correct. And before he gives you the version with Lisa's uh, stabbing Marcella, you tell him it's in his best interest. Uh, to tell you what happened, this is his only chance, right? Yes. yes. And before he gives a version of Lisa and Nina coming into the room attacking Maricela, you tell him that those attorneys are going to point the finger at you. Correct. Don't you? Correct. So you need him to believe that they're going to point the finger at him if he doesn't point the finger at them. Well, no, just for him to actually say what happened, put him in a bound him in a corner and try him to try him try to get information from him. That was the whole purpose. Okay. But at some point you tell him the attorneys are gonna point the finger at you. Yes. They're gonna save themselves. Correct. And remember Ortiz 
Tell him I know you're scared. I can see your the heart, the yeah. his vein. Yeah, I know you're scared, right? Yes. And what y'all ask him? What did they do? And that's when he goes into this version of Lisa going towards him and Marcella with a knife. Well, well that, no, no, no. no that's, not the, that's not the first one. No, version. no. The, the, the next it. version was they came into the room, they were arguing with him because of they were, he had the girl over there and they were doing drugs. Correct, correct. They argued and they left. They left. Then him and Marcella went to sleep. Next thing he knows, that's when, that's when Lisa came in. Yes. And he woke up with Lisa uh, straddled over Marcella. Do you remember that part? I remember one of the verses he said that um, Ms. Dykes was actually straddled over Maricela. All right, and do you remember him talking about her having her hand on his neck? Just one, one hand on the neck, and then I think the left one, and then the right one with the with the knife. With the knife. All right, uh, and he's telling you that she stabbed him, right? Yes, an emotion, force, forceful. I can't remember what word he used, but well, well I mean, he's actually motioning. Yes, now. he is. Stabbing. Yes. Stabbing Marcella, correct? Correct. And he says uh, in that version that he pushes her, pushes them off, right? Push her off the bed. Does he tell you to push both of them off or just Lisa? I think it was just Lisa at that moment. In, in that version? Yes, if I'm mistaken, it was her. Okay. Uh, and he runs out of the room. It's, it's I think, doesn't Nina come in? Well, he says Nina comes, comes in, in. And then from there, he takes off. Nina pushes him. And he takes off, but it gets his clothes on. He didn't have his clothes on. He put clothes on and take off. But he specifically told you that Nina comes in and helps attack Maricel, right? I don't recall hearing that, or that he actually said that Nina attacked. Well, he said they attacked. Okay. They referred okay. to Lisa we'll to, hmm. Yeah. Right? Correct. And, I mean, the fact that he says that Nina came in the room and they attacked, attacked. Maricela again. It should be both. I'm sorry, what did you? I said it should be both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's aiding in your investigation to charge uh, Nina Morano with murder, right? Correct. The fact that after he claims Lisa stabbed her, she comes in to help him attack her, right? Correct. Because that's what Beltran told you. That's what he said. And remember him saying something about uh, him running out of there and, and just leaving? Yes. Uh, I think he said something about Marcella was saying, babe. He said, him baby. that's what he said initially. That he, she was calling him baby, baby. And then afterward, he said, he doesn't know who said that. Right. But either way, he ran out of there and left. Yes. And in this version, he tells you that he left and he calls his homeboy, Brian. Yes. And tells Brian what happened. Right? He said the girls were tripping or something like that. Right, but he tells you he calls Brian. Yes. And that was a lie. According to him, yes. <laughs> well, no, I'm saying he never called Brian because you would have talked to Brian. Correct. You would have asked Brian, hey, man, what did he say? Right? Correct. But he says he left, right? Yes. In any of these versions that he gave you regarding this attack, this stabbing, um, did he ever say anything about pinning Lisa Dykes against the wall? No. Did he ever say anything about Lisa? You y'all 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 take care of this. That he told her that he was pinned up against the wall. And, uh, and he told him, hey, y'all need to take care of this. And he left. No, I do not recall. On that interview I had with him, no, he did not but say that. You know he never told y'all that, did he? No, that's what I'm saying, no.
And as far as, uh, you remember also telling him, ask, or asking him, referring to Mr. Beltran, uh, why didn't you just call the police if you didn't do anything? Yes, I did ask him that. And he said he didn't think anybody would believe him, right? Yes, he said he was scared. Because of the way he looked, his record, no one's going to believe he had nothing to do with it, right? Correct. Oh, the, uh, the Santa Morta, um, he admitted that that was his stuff at the house, right? Yes. Okay. And you, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the altar that was in the room, you know what I'm yes. talking about? Yes, yes, that's his. All right. Oh, you, do you also remember, uh, even after him giving his last version, and you're just really just going over his activities after, uh, like when he went to New Orleans, remember that? Mm -hmm. he yes. Told, he told you he went to New Orleans with Lisa, remember that? But it was a f another friend, it wasn't Lisa Dyke. No, I'm t I, I know it wasn't another friend, I'm asking you what he told me. That's what he said, it was Lisa. He said it was Lisa. Mm -hmm. So he's still lying to you, right? Yes. Because you know it was Madeline, right? Yes, yes. But he's saying Lisa. Correct. Lisa took him to New Orleans. That's what he said. Yes. He said, they're going to make it seem like you are a monster. Remember telling him that? Yes. And that's before he gives you the version regarding Ms. Dox, right? Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, you were the you were the leader detective, right? Correct. But not anymore, right? No. You were demoted, correct? I was transferred. So you weren't demoted? I'm still in my same rank, not as a detective though. Okay, you're just not a detective anymore. Correct. And that's largely because of the videos. Things that happened on this this case. Yes, sir. All the videos and things that, that went missing. Not that was not the reason. Is for because I actually forgot to actually send over the videos, and when I caught it, I made corrections right away. I was just on a mistake. Well, but that, that was the only one. evidence you didn't turn over. You still had stuff in your trunk, didn't you? The trunk. Didn't you bring over boxes? What? Well, that was from 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 headquarters. Oh, okay, you had to go back over to headquarters? Yes, that's where we got everything. Okay. But that was all stuff that you just didn't turn over? Until, until the judge made you turn it over, right? Which... Can you remind me? I'm talking about the stuff that you just left in your closet at headquarters. What closet? Where, where were the bones? 
Oh, the, the box. Bones? Yes. Yeah, the, the box, box with the bones. What, 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 what was that? At headquarters. In your closet? Well, it was, oh, in, it was in a file. In a file? Mm-hmm. Okay. But yeah, we have to answer yes or no. Yes. Mm. But again, that involved this case. Yes. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, I just want to start with that, kind of what he left off with, okay? Yes. Um, you and I had met several times over the course of, uh, you know, when I received this case and was assigned this case in, I think, May of 2022. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what he's talking about essentially is that uh, you had, a, there's a DME system online. Uh, where there are photographs, videos, things of that nature, and a, a portal on your end, and you have to tag it a certain way, hit a button, and, and that's simplifying it for that those things to transfer to our end. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. We had discovered right before trial that um, several photographs, and, and to be very clear, the vast majority of the photographs that we were talking about that were transferred late were all photographs of property from the arrest of Nina Morano and Lisa Dice. Is that correct? Correct. And it was all their property. Yes. And they majority. knew all of what they had. Is that right? Correct. So that was a vast majority of the things that were turned over late. Yes. Now, uh, this box that we're discussing um, in, I believe it was January of 2022, um, January, February of 2022, February 2nd, you actually... Uh, talked to some individuals who were out of the site. They're, the community is highly involved in this case, and you know they have like a little memorial out there that people go to and, and tend to. Is that correct? Yes. And that's where her body was found. Is that correct? Yes. And it was about a year and a half or maybe a year and several months after the her remains were found at that site that these people were out there. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they picked up a, a bra and some panties uh, that were out there and then uh, two bones. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And um, based on the length of time, um, it just, you know, it wasn't tested, it wasn't um, put in the property room, and it didn't appear that those items would be re necessarily related to this case because it had been in over a year since her remains had been found. Correct. And you were out there uh, for at least one of the searches. There was a couple of searches at that site after the initial find. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. And dozens of people, you know, this far the apart, or three, four feet apart from each other, walking back and forth through there to find as many items as they, they could. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, it's safe to say that if there was a, a pair of bra and panties out there at that time, uh, certainly those would have been picked up. Correct. Okay. And um, you're aware that the testing after that was done where it, it, those items did not come back to anybody related to this case. Correct. Now, um, let's go back and talk about... Um, you know, kind of the uh, sequence of events as far as uh, prior to talking to Charles Beltran, okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you recall going to uh, Florida in March to try to locate uh, Lisa and Nina and Charles Beltran? Yes, ma'am. And you guys had some tips, or not necessarily tips, but you had some cell phone records and some addresses and things like that that, that led you to believe they might be in Miami. Is that right? Yes. And you guys followed up on that? Yes. And you got the Florida Department of uh, Law Enforcement to help you, is that yes, right? Yes, we did. And uh, just before that, uh, I believe it was March 22nd of 2021, you actually uh, had the three warrants signed by a judge here in Dallas, is that right? Yes. And uh, you had the probable cause affidavit, and, and that particular judge reviewed over it, and he felt like you had probable cause for the arrest of all three of them, is yes. that right? Yes. Okay, so that was before you ever talked to anybody. Correct. Uh, that was even before uh, her remains were found. Is that right? Correct. Okay, you guys were actually in Florida when you got word that uh, a, a person that was trying to track feral cats out in Wilmer, uh, just off the road, just off of, I believe, is it Post Oak Road? Yes. Uh, just off of that road had found a, a skull. Yes. 
And uh, based on that, they were able to do dental identification records, and it was confirmed that that, that was Maricela. Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. Um, now, at that point, um, you all found a good address in Miami for uh, Nina Morado. Is that right? Correct. And uh, FDLE actually sent uh, someone to sit on her house um, and, and surveillance. <laughs> Survey our house and, and just watch and see the comings and goings of, you know, who all was coming coming in and out. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And in the course of that, uh, the individual that was sitting on that house ended up making arrest of Nina Morado. Correct. correct? Okay. And uh, he wasn't able to arrest Lisa, though, because she ran right then. She left that apartment right then and took off to Orlando. Is that right? Correct. And uh, you went up to Orlando, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, Lisa was arrested in Orlando, is that right? Correct. Okay. And uh, it wasn't, that was on March 26th that she was arrested, does that correct. sound right? Yes. And Nina Morano was arrested the day prior. Correct. <laughs> now, at that point, uh, they were waiting to see if Charles Beltrain would be at the hotel room with Lisa, is that, is that your understanding? My understanding, yes. Okay, but he wasn't there, was he? No. Okay, so the U.S. Marshals uh, start looking for him, and they get some leads that um, at some point he is in Utah. Correct. And a team is sent out, out there to Utah, and they find him and arrest him. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so at the point that you um, talked to Charles Beltran, um, Nina and Lisa have already been arrested, correct? Yes. The warrant had already been issued. Yes. Okay, so you didn't you didn't get the probable cause based on anything that Charles Beltran told you. No, um, it had already been done. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about your interview with uh, Mr. Beltran. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, it was over two hours long. Is that right? Yes. And it's uh, fair to say for the first forty-five minutes, he pretends like he didn't know anything. Correct. Um, you weren't convinced of that, were you? Correct. Now, you are convinced because you've done this full investigation. You started with this case on uh, December 8th of uh, 2020. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And Maricela Batella had been missing since October 5th. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Now, you knew that Maricela Batello was a responsible individual. You knew that she had a job. You knew that she had a stable family. She had friends. She had all the, the reasons to go back to Seattle on October 5th as her flight had been scheduled. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you knew based on talking to these people that her not posting on social media and all those things, just that was not normal for her at all. Correct. And um, and you, you know that you the Youth Crimes Division that does these missing persons, they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of missing persons, um, missing persons uh, reports on young people in their early 20s that just decided not to show back up home. True, correct. Um, and most of the time, uh, those missing persons end up just showing back up. Yes. Uh, maybe they went out and, and you know wanted to you know, go do drugs for several days, go prostitute at hotels and things like that. Um, that's kind of what that normally looks like. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. The reason you all got involved is because her bank records showed no activity at all. Correct. Her phone records showed no activity at all. Correct. No contact with family. Correct. It's like she dropped off the face of the earth. Yes. It's like she had been murdered. Correct. Um, so that's why eventually uh, the Special Investigations Unit got involved, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so you know all these things before you ever talk to Charles Beltran, is yes, that right? Yes, ma'am. You also knew that uh, the FBI task, uh, the FBI had gotten involved early on about October 12th in trying to locate Maricel, is that right? Correct. You knew that they had talked to Lisa Dykes and Lisa Dykes lied to him, you knew that. Correct. Okay, you knew that Charles went on the run with Metal and Alvarez first. Yes. You knew that Lisa and Nina met him up in Pennsylvania. Yes. You knew that they traveled uh, up to Buffalo and got him a passport. Correct. You knew that Lisa and Nina had paid off his child support so that he could get that passport. Correct. You knew that he had gone all the way to Mexico with Lisa and Nina and that they had been there for three to four weeks. Is that correct? 
uh, you knew that, that Lisa and Nina had been mm -hmm. traveling freely back and forth. Is that right? Correct. You knew that Nina had suddenly, out of nowhere, decided to sell her house in Pennsylvania. Correct. In fact, she made a call uh, around October 12th, and this was the same time that the first missing persons of Maricela Botello reports come out in the news. Correct. I mean, is that just a coincidence, or is that something that makes you think that these ladies are involved? Make, it, make me feel that they were involved. So you know all this information before you even talk to Charles Beltry, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. And generally in interrogations, uh, when you're talking to um, an individual, one of the techniques is just to let them know, you know, you can talk, you can tell me whatever, you let them tell that story, right? Yes. That's, yeah. you're taught that. Yes, tell them, just have them say whatever they want to say, and then from there, poke at their story. Right, and so that, you don't expect any person that you talk to, to right off the bat start telling you everything that happened. Correct. It's when they're confronted with evidence that you know, that you have in the case, uh, that they start telling you, oh, okay, I need to tell you the truth because she knows what she's talking about. Correct. And that's the technique that you used in this case. Is yes. that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we're talking about the first 45 minutes of uh, his interview. He acting like he just dropped her off somewhere or he didn't know or he just didn't know what happened to her. Correct. That didn't surprise you at all, did it? No, ma'am. Okay. And uh, I believe your partner mentioned the capital murder and one of those punishes, uh, punishments uh, could possibly be the death penalty, but that's not something you guys even decide, right? No, no, okay. we don't. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we don't. Police are <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> and I mean, you're aware that, you know, that, that rarely happens here in Dallas County for uh, the, our office to see the death penalty. Correct. Now, he didn't really bat an eye at that, did he? No. That didn't seem to bother him at all, did it? No. It was when you started talking about his daughters that he decided and he changed and he started telling you bits of the truth. Is that Correct. right? Correct. And you ex fully expect when you interview someone that you're not going to get all the truth at once. Correct. You're going to get bits. You're going to get pieces. I mean, that's just human nature, right? Correct. I mean, that's how most people, uh, when they are confronted with evidence that their story ain't jiving, that's how they that's how they operate they do I mean my teenager does it all the time um, it's the same with Charles Beltry correct so in this situation you talk about his daughters and then he starts telling you um, that he knows more about what happened in that room is that right correct okay now I want to make a, a distinction Ms. Pittman if you could mark your spot it is time for our Yes, sir. We will be at recess for five to ten minutes. All right.
affidavit um, that you presented to Judge Carter Thompson on March 22nd, 2022? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you have reviewed that uh, before? Yes. Okay, and I just want to look at um, the second page. The defense had asked you about uh, Charles Beltran and Lisa Dykes and Nina Murano, their blood being mixed in with um, Maricela Botello's blood yes, uh, there at, at the scene in his bedroom. Is that correct? Correct. And that location was right next to uh, Beltran's bed, just right under the window in his bedroom. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and that's where that big blood stain was, where all of that uh, blue star reacted, and that was the, the biggest indication that something had happened to Maricela in that room. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and there's an important distinction. It did say that blood was found to match the complainant, Maricela Botello, um, but it also says unknown male and D, uh, female DNA profiles were found in the carpet by Swifts. Correct. Okay. Uh, that's not to say uh, at that time you had any certainty that those DNA profiles uh, were from blood. Correct. Okay, it could be from uh, touch DNA, it could be from, um, you know, some other source besides blood. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that's why you listed it that way in your probable cause affidavit. Is that correct? Yes. And you learned that, uh, you know, Mr. Beltran had other uh, women over there, right? Yes. I mean, Lisa Dykes and Nina Morano both live there, so presumably they go in his room. Is that correct? Yes. Um, he also had uh, male individuals coming over. Is that right? Yes. Okay, but the primary uh, source of the blood DNA wasn't just on the carpet. It, it was seeped down into the carpet pad. Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. Now, and you knew all this information when you were uh, talking to Mr. Beltran. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so when you told him that the DNA was in there, um, you just wanted him to, to know that you had some information so that maybe he would tell you more. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And uh, he even said, I mean, it's certainly possible that if there's a stabbing going on that he may get nicked, that uh, Miss Dykes may cut herself, and that may be the source of some of these DNA profiles. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. But at that time, in Jan uh, I'm sorry, in... Um, January 29th of 2021, when you received that first DNA report, you didn't have the buckle swabs for Charles Beltran. You didn't have the buckle swab for Lisa Dykes, and you didn't have the buckle swab for Nina Morano. Is that correct? Correct. That's because they weren't even in Dallas, were they? Correct. They were all over. Um, it's certainly something you wanted. Yes. Okay, so you certainly wanted to talk to Miss Dykes, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. Um, you certainly wanted to talk to any of these individuals, correct? Correct. Uh, but if you can't find them, you can't talk to them. Correct. Now, you went up to New York. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Black Audi, and that was kind of a focus of your investigation, trying to find that Black Audi because you knew that, based on the video evidence, that Charles Beltran had been in that Black Audi with Maricela Botello. Is that correct? Correct. Um, at that time, you didn't know anything about a white Tucson. No. Okay. I don't think so. And so your focus is on that. And the reason, uh, other than the 7-Eleven video, that your focus is on that is because you also learned uh, through the FBI investigation that Lisa Dykes was talking to several co-workers about trying to get rid of a car. Correct. And it was the Black Audi, right? Correct. So the focus was on that at that time, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And so you actually went to New York and you went to the dealership where Lisa Dice entered the dealership and Nina Morano entered the dealership and sold off that black Audi. Is that correct? They did sell it. And that's, that's after they had that black Audi shipped from Dallas all the way up to New York. Correct. Okay. And they didn't even sell it in the town they were living in. No. They sold it in another town, Middletown, New York. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Correct. Uh, you had the New York State Police get involved and process that vehicle, didn't you? Correct. And when you, they process that vehicle, you ask them to do Blue Star, or the equivalent uh, in New York. Is that right? Yes. And your understanding is the same same type of chemical. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't any indication that there was any blood in that trunk, was there? Correct. Okay. And there was indication that there were some hairs that were found that he collected in the back of that trunk. Is that right? Correct. And at the time of the probable cause affidavit, you... One of those hairs was a long, straight black hair. Is that right? Correct. That didn't seem to match any of the three individuals uh, that you were trying to contact. Correct. 
Now, you also, while you were in uh, New York and Pennsylvania, you're trying to talk to them, aren't you? Correct. You went to uh, Nina Morano's home. Yes. Okay, and at that time, I believe she was going by Nina Beltran. Is that right? Correct. Did you learn that at some point in this, uh, Nina uh, Morano and Lisa Dykes, uh, first of all, had changed their last name to Beltran? Correct. And then shortly after uh, Maricela went missing, they actually changed their names on their identifications and passports. Correct. Now, when you went and talked to these people, did they, you talked to some of her neighbors, right? Yes. And their neighbors reported that, you know, Nina was a friendly person. Yes. Uh, before Lisa. Correct. Um, things changed when Lisa got the picture, didn't they? Yes. And prior to Lisa Dykes being in the picture, she, Nina Murata was just kind of a family person. She had her husband Bill there. They had a, a long-term marriage. And uh, suddenly um, he passed away. Yes. You learned that. Uh, you learned that Nina had not told any of her, her friends in that neighborhood that he had passed away. Correct. Until months later. Correct. At that time, she was seeing Miss Dykes, wasn't she? Correct. Did you learn from the neighbors that when Nina Morano returned back to Pennsylvania, uh, in uh, around December of 2020 that suddenly all the shades are down, there's sheets over the windows, it's dark, and Miss Morano's not friendly anymore. Correct. That was completely out of character for her, wasn't it? Yes. You did a, a you interviewed Jamie Scarpa, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. And uh, she told you some information regarding the sale of the house. Yes. She hadn't really met Miss Dykes, had she? No. I mean, just one time? Just met her once. She never met Charles Beltran, did she? No. But she was just trying to give you information to help your investigation? Yes. You left a business card with Miss Scarpa, didn't you? Yes. And uh, just advise her, let Nina know we just want to talk to her. Is that right? Correct. Did you ever hear from Miss Morano? No. Did you ever hear from Miss Dykes? No. And you didn't hear from Mr. Beltran either, did you? No. In fact, after you left that business card, you learned that they sold the house. And prior to even selling the house, they weren't living there anymore. Correct. Um, did you learn that, that right after you gave them that business card is when they... Uh, quit staying in Pennsylvania? Correct. And so you're trying to look for him again? Again. Mm -hmm. Now, in the interim of going to New York and trying to locate him and, and things of that nature, uh, that, that blood swab that... Um, those swabbings from the carpet are being tested with Swiss. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so in January, you get those results, and, and it, you de it's determined what you already believe to be true, and that the, that blood belonged to Maricela Batella. Yes. And based on that, you all start searching uh, various areas, uh, or highlighting various areas in Wilmer to possibly search. Yes. Okay. And... You did that based on the phone records of Nina Morano and Lisa Dykes, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Did you learn that Lisa Dykes used to live out there uh, at, at 274 Turning Tree? Yes. And that's a little little tiny housing development just right off of I-45, is that right? Correct. Okay, and uh, I think you exit Beltline Road. And yes. And you can right off I-45, you take a left on Beltline, and it's just right there to the left. Correct. And you learned that she lived there for a number of years. Yes. Okay. Um, Nina never lived with her there, did she? No. Okay, and Charles never lived there with no. her. No. You base the, how big is Wilmer? Not that big. Okay, not that big? No, I, I would say, I'm not sure what the population is, but it's a sm very small town, I mean, a suburb of Dallas. Okay, and, and area-wise, is there uh, quite a bit of area out there to search? Yes. Lots of different kind of open areas. There's a lot of trailers as far as um, uh, hauling a 
tra gravel or whatever from the highway. There's a lot of uh, cement places and a lot of, I guess, land. <laughs> okay. Pretty much. Cement plants, mm -hmm. you know, kind of some industrial type of uh, locations. Uh, but there's also a lot of farmland. Yes. A lot of wooded areas. Yes. Um, and, and a lot of that is not far at all from that turning point drive. Is that correct? Correct. At some point, you guys did a search uh, March 6th of 2021, and you based that again on knowing that Lisa and Nina's phones were out there in Wilmer that night, October 5th, after Maricela went missing, correct? Correct. Now, Beltran's phones weren't there, were they? No. Um, it showed his phone to be actually down in Deep Belt, yes. right? Yes. And that's, I mean, that's what he told me, that he right. was down in Deep Belt that night. Now, the March 6th search, uh, that was, uh, at an address on uh, 1701 uh, Fulgham Road, is that correct? Yes. And eventually her body was found off of Post Oak Road, is that correct? Correct. Um, the reason you concentrated on the concrete plant was because the black Audi appeared to have some cement on the underneath side of it, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And so based on that information that you have, you're doing everything you can. Correct. In fact, it makes more sense to search a concrete plant at that point than just going through the acres and acres and acres of farmland out there. Correct. And we're talking hundreds of acres of farmland. Uh -huh. Wooded areas. Yes, ma'am. I mean, like finding a needle in a haystack. Correct. That first witness, Your Honor? You may. Detective, I'm handing you what's been uh, marked uh, States Exhibit 394 and 395. Uh, does that look like a map of the Fulgham Road area uh, in that area in Wilmer? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And that's a fair and accurate representation of that? Yes, ma'am. And then 395, is that a photograph of the area that you all searched March 6, 2021? Correct. Okay. Your Honor, State Offer States 394 and 395 for all purposes, tendering the Defense Council. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I'm just going to zoom into it a little bit. And it appears, I mean, there's um, a lot of pavement and concrete and things like that uh, right there in that that initial area. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how was it or how accessible was that area via car? Pretty much uh, easy. I mean, they had gates, but they were open and people can actually drive through. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's gates that are open mm -hmm. and you can drive through. And then how far from this concreted area um, was it before you got to some, some of the wooded areas? Uh, with I think maybe there was some water and, and bodies of water out there? In the, in the plant, yes. Okay, about how far of a walk is it from the area that you can park your car on concrete to the area where uh, maybe you might think to locate a body? It was a long distance. I mean, I would say, um, I don't know, probably a quarter of a mile, I guess. Maybe. Quarter of a mile? Yes, I would say. I mean, and it was a long, uh, big property, so some of it was concrete because they were filling it in, and then the rest in the back was more water, and it was um, in the process of being covered because there was a, a the owner that owned that plant that had the construction uh, site debris coming in to the property to kind of top it off and then you had um, what is a, a, a cement company at the, I think it's a cement company uh, next to them that was actually uh, being leased there so there was two two areas there and compared to uh, where the body was located over here at Post Oak Road or actually uh, just the bones were located over here off of Post Oak Road that's about a two and a half mile drive about five minutes is that right yes ma'am Okay, and there at Post Oak Road, I mean, both sides of the road, there's kind of open farmland on both sides. Yes. And then the location where a body was found, there was actually, when you're facing from the road, 
to the right is kind of open farmland area, correct? Yes. And then to the left, it's a kind of a wooded area. Yes. And that wooded area, the I guess the culvert, there's a lot of brush and things that are grown up that, that kind of block the view of that wooded area. Yes. Okay. And it's just a short walk through that brush, and it's easy to get through that brush. We're yes. not talking about uh, briars and thorns. I mean, you can just walk through it easily. Yes. And it was just over that that uh, many of the remains were found. Is that correct? Yes. But you can't see that area from the road. No. Um, because of all the brush and, and all of that. Correct. Um, as far as uh, being able to walk in that area, was it that difficult to get to? No. <clears throat> Your understanding, so this is I-45 um, right here. Dallas is back this way, correct? Yes. Okay. So if you're traveling from Dallas or Mesquite area, take I-45 this way. You exit Beltline Road. Thank you, Zach. You exit Beltline Road right here, and you take a left onto Beltline Road, and there is a little housing development right here on uh, East Beltline Road. Is that yeah. right? Yes, ma'am. And that's where 274 Turning Tree Road is, correct? Yes. And it is literally two turns. Go down Beltline, take a left, and you stop right there, and this is where that body was found. Yes. In States 395, is this the area that you were talking about that you initially searched in uh, at Fulgham Road? Yes. Okay, and so where, at this entrance, uh, where would you park your vehicle? We were, can I point? I mean, it's for the star, a little bit where the star is at, it's where we actually uh, parked. Okay. I mean, there's opening area there, but we actually went to the middle and then worked our way okay. around. Okay, is this where you park the vehicles? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that drive through there, is it uh, all paved, like a parking lot, or what was that drive? It's kind of rough. Um, it's, you know, gravel and cement, you know, area. So it's, I mean, it's drivable, but it's not, um, like, paved. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's and pressed down, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, it's a pretty significant walk back into this area? Yes, yeah, some of the areas were actually um, water, like I said, had water. So they were actually making ways to actually put the trucks in to actually uh, dump debris from the 35 construction to cover that area. Okay. And I guess my point is uh, if two women are dumping a five foot tall, 100 pound, Hispanic woman, it would be a lot easier to do it right there off of Post Oak Road, right? Yes, ma'am. I mean, that's totally feasible. Yes. I mean, Maricela wasn't heavy, was she? No, ma'am. I mean, she was tiny. Yes. And, and two women of uh, <coughs> bigger statue, stature wouldn't have an issue um, taking that small body uh, wrapped in a uh, trash bag and taped with duct tape and just taking it just off the road and dumping it behind that brush. Correct. Now, you spoke to a number of people in your investigation, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Now, you didn't get this case until, until December 8th of 2020, correct? Correct. And many of the tips that uh, Mr. Harris asked you about, those were all received and um, investigated and, and the officers had been sent out on those tips prior to you ever getting on the case, correct? Yes, ma'am. So you're just reading their incident reports as to what happened, right? Yes. And that one that he mentioned about Orlando Brown, that wasn't the only person that said they saw someone similar to Maricela Botello. Correct. In fact, there was another uh, tip where officers were sent out uh, to a bus stop. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, I believe the, the patron said that, I mean, it looked like her, it might be her, it's the same build, it's the same as a, you know, a Hispanic female, the same size, maybe it's her, I don't know, correct? Correct. And you all were able to get information that the person who they saw actually purchased a bus ticket and wasn't Maricela Botello at all. Correct. <clears throat> um, so it's not like you, that these tips are panning out at all. Right. But people are following up on it. Yes. Now, the Mustang Inn and the City Inn, are you familiar with those two places? Kind of. I know it's in, I think, in Oak Cliff, if I'm mistaken. Okay, and you know that, that those two 
uh, places are like motels and yes. it's, it's known uh, drug houses and uh, a lot of prostitution and things like that go on there. Yes. Is there any indication from Maricela's family members or friends or anyone that you talk to that that would be a place that she would go? That would not be a place for her to go. I mean, she's never been to Dallas before. No. Would she even know how to get to these places? She wouldn't. And so you're, you're trying, and people are trying to help, right? Yes. I mean, they're not trying to mislead you. They're trying to help. Uh, right. Do you know what picture uh, they used to show Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown and, and the security guard, Floyd Mitchell, um, to say if this is Maricela Vitello or not? I, I, don't miss, I don't remember. Okay, and you weren't a part of that, so you weren't there, you wouldn't know. Correct. Right? Mr. Hayes can answer that question for us. Yes. <laughs> but what you do know, uh, when you get on the case in December 8th of uh, 2020, you're desperately trying to find Lisa Dykes, you're desperately trying to find Nina Murano and Charles Beltran. Um, were you aware that Nina and Lisa Murano got new passports with their uh, new last name on December 10th of 2020? Yes. So it doesn't appear that they're trying to be found. Correct. You talk to people in Dallas, uh, Charles Beltran's friends, uh, Charles Beltran's, uh, some of his girlfriends, correct? Correct. You talk to Miss Alvarez, uh, Madeline Alvarez, right? Yes. She was very reluctant, wasn't she? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, uh, he had told you, told him that, you know, we knew you went to New Orleans, who'd you go with? And he said, he kind of fumbled through and said, Lisa. Did you believe the girl's name was Lisa? No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew it was Madeline Alvarez at that time. Yes. And, I mean, it's, it's obvious um, that Madeline Alvarez didn't want her name involved in this at all. Correct. Um, for whatever reason. Correct. Um, she never indicated, though, that she was afraid personally of Mr. Beltran, was she? If she said she was afraid? Yeah, did she ever say she was afraid of Mr. Beltran doing something to her? No. Okay, so that wasn't her fear, was it? Right. A lot of people don't want to get involved. Correct. Did you review some of the text messages from the phone that uh, Lisa Dykes was using when she was arrested? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And it was clear in that, again, that she felt like a sitting duck. Yes. And uh, she needed somebody to watch her back. Correct. Uh, she even indicated uh, in a conversation that uh, she needed, do you know who Kyle Williams is? Yes, her son. Okay. Were you ever able to talk to Kyle Williams? I tried to, never responded. Okay, so Mr. Williams never responded to no. you. No. Um, and you were aware that his girlfriend was Val Salinas, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, were you aware in those messages that she's asking Kyle and Val, does Val speak Spanish? Correct. I'll let you know why I need to know that when I see you. Correct. Um, asking them to use their cards to uh, reserve rooms. Correct. And they are driving from Dallas to her um, to, to help her. Correct. Were you aware, did you learn in your investigation that Kyle Williams actually went to the home in Kensington after Lisa and Nina suddenly left and helped move furniture out? Correct. And you don't know where that furniture went? No, ma'am. In those text messages, did she ever indicate that she was concerned or worried about Nina Morano's well-being in jail after she got arrested, if you recall? I don't recall. But she I was don't. worried about getting her money, right? Correct. Now, They were, uh, Lisa and Nina were arrested in um, Florida. 
they were transported back here to Dallas. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and uh, they were booked in here to the Dallas County Jail. Were you aware that they uh, bonded out? Yes. And uh, did Charles Beltran ever bond out? No. He actually was transported back from Utah and uh, back here to Dallas as well, correct? Correct. And that process takes a while, so do you have any idea how long it was before he got back here? Was it probably a month, I think, maybe? And that's that's about mm -hmm. uh, standard. Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as uh, getting people back and extradited from other states. Yes. And it took about the same for Lisa and Nina, is that correct? Correct. What you didn't, so you knew that the Lisa and Nina had bonded out of jail and they were on house arrest. Correct. Uh, means they're not supposed to leave the house without, uh, in, except for, you know, necessary reasons, medical, uh, things of that nature. Correct. And what you couldn't predict, though, was that they were going to tamper with their leg monitoring device and flee to Cambodia. Correct. Uh, at the time that they were on bond, you didn't ever, you can't talk to them, right? No. Um, you can't go search their house, can you? No. You can't go get their devices and see what they're doing, can you? Correct. But after they uh, fled to Cambodia uh, on Christmas Day of 2021, just a few months after being arrested for this, um, you contacted the FBI and got some help. Yes. I mean, Dallas Police Department doesn't have... Uh, the long arm of the law all the way into Cambodia mm -hmm. to grab those people and bring them back, right? Correct. So the FBI got involved. Yes. You also know that the first parts, once the DA gets the case, and I believe both of these cases, Ms. Dyke's cases were indicted in June of uh, 2022. Yes. I'm sorry, June of 2021. 21. Mm -hmm. um, you're aware that those first few months, there's really not a lot going on in court um, as far as hearings and things of that nature. Correct. I mean, you were never called up to court, no, right? Um, you know, that process is just for the attorneys to kind of exchange information and discovery. Um, and that initial discovery that you gave, you had given the DA's office all the instant reports of the, the follow-up tips that we just discussed, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the defense had that information back in 2021, um, as far as you as far as you know. Yes. Okay. This was not the photographs of Lisa and Nina's property and those types of uh, some of the audio recordings of Maricela's friends and um, those types of things that were turned over later, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But nothing's going on here at that time. Correct. Um, in fact, if you, you come up to the courthouse frequently to testify on different matters and, and you know check in with DAs and things like that, right? Yes, ma'am. And a lot of times, I mean, you see the, literally defense attorneys will walk in, hand a DA a pass slip, they'll sign it and say, we'll talk later, and that's their exchange for that day. Pretty much, yes. Now... At some point, are you communicating with the FBI while they are, uh, I guess, trying to locate Lisa and Nina? Yes, trying to get as much information as we can. Okay. And you learned that at some point they were located in a small coastal town in Cambodia, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, and that they were arrested there in that small Cambodian town, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and you learned that they were arrested uh, with several laptops, um, flash drives, um, SIM cards, cell phones, all those things. Yes. Um, you carry two cell phones, one for work and one personal? Yes. Not five? No. <laughs> and when they were arrested, though, all those items were seized, correct? Yes. Um, at some point, the FBI transferred those items back to you, and that was in uh, probably June or July of 2022? Around, around there. Yes. Okay. And you requested fusion at some point, received search warrants, uh, or I don't think you did, but somebody in Dallas Police Department um, got those search warrants signed and all those devices went to the fusion unit 
for the financial crimes to be analyzed. Is yes. that correct? Yes. And you learned at some point that Lisa and Nina had a copy of Chuck's interview on their flash drive. Yes. And you know enough about court proceedings and the discovery rules that they're not supposed to have that, are they? Correct. Uh, but they had it in their possession on their flash drive. Yes. And it was just months after they bonded out, left Chuck in jail, that they fled to Cambodia. Correct. Y'all are past the witness. Any read the record? What do you mean? The first search that y'all did out in that location, out in the Williams, in the uh, Wilmer area. Okay, so you're asking if we didn't find anything? Yeah. We were referring to the body? No, no. okay. I'm sorry. What, what I'm asking is, the first search that was conducted in that area, <clears throat> because the phones were pinging, remember? Okay, yes. Y'all didn't find anything connecting to uh, Marcella, correct? No. Um, it, was all, it was only after y'all, did y'all use the, the uh, canine dogs on the first search? Do you know? I believe so. I know we used them twice, at least twice. Okay. And it was only after, um, I think the person that was set in the trap, Calling y'all about the bones? Yes. It was a year after, yeah. not a year, yes. But y'all thought they were just animal bones, right? Correct. But then when we got them tested, we found out that they were actually human bones, right? I believe so. Um, and not just human bones, but, but, but Marcella's bones, right? Do you remember that? What was that? The, the bones that that you bought, uh, that were in the box that people bought to you, mm -hmm. we did DNA testing on that, right? Okay. You didn't know? No. I know I requested it, yeah, but I'm not sure what the roots were. Is that because you were off the case at that time? Yes. But as far as that, Initial search when they they searched that whole area they didn't find anything correct. The first search are you referring to the plant area or where she was actually found? They searched that whole, they searched that area even when she was was found right the yes. first time. But you keep saying first these are two different times so I want to make sure they're on the same page. Okay, well, well tell me again what, what you know about the searches. But yeah, what the are first you? search right. Yes, but you say first search, what are you referring to? I'm referring to when the FBI, all those guys went out there looking for uh, evidence connected to this murder case. Okay, so you're talking about the Post Oak location. So the Post Oak location is different from where they actually found Marcel? The Post Oak is where they found her. Okay. I was. I don't know if you're referring to the one on Felgum Road, so that's why I was asking which one. So the initial 
because they helped out, you know. Right, so the initial one didn't include pulse ultra, is that what you're saying? Okay, there's two different searches, okay? Mm -hmm. One at the plant where the phone's pinged, you know, as far as the information, we searched there. And then after uh, someone called and said that uh, there was uh, phones found, remains found, what? then we went there afterwards. But you keep saying where the phones ping, that's just, I mean, that tower not only pings at that location, it pings at other locations no, in that area, right? No, but what I was asking is, is to see which one were you referring to when you said search. Okay, well, let's, let, let, let's. You know what I mean? Let, let's, yeah, I understand, but let's talk about you again telling the members of the jury that they phones pinged at that area. That area is only one of, of many locations that those phones pinged off in that one area. Correct. Right? Correct. Is that like, you know? Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is now uh, almost 12.15. We will go ahead and break for lunch. Uh, you are expected back in the jury room at later than 1.15 p.m. Please remember your instructions, and we will see you at 1.15. All rise. Right. We are at recess until then.
Officer William Hayes, badge number 11526, police officer with the Dallas Police Department. How long have you been a police officer with Dallas PD? Going on a little bit over five years. Okay. On October 13th, 2020, um, what was your position with uh, Dallas PD at that time? Um, I was working in uh, Channel 7 as a regular patrol officer. And do you remember um, receiving a call uh, for service at 1117 Betterton Circle in Dallas, uh, Dallas County, Texas? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what was that call concerning? That was a health and wellness call. Okay. And what did you do, Officer Hayes? Um, so we immediately you know, proceed to the location. Um, so as we're going to the location, that's when we start getting the background information on um, the actual health and wellness uh, call. What, uh, what, mm -hmm. bra what background information were you receiving? Um, we were receiving information on uh, Ms. Botello um, and about how she was missing and uh, you know, basically checking up on this, this area. Um, the area uh, which we were checking um, happened to be a known drug house in the area. So we kind of proceeded with caution, and that's when we, you know, started to, you know, receive other information about the uh, the residents being watched. Um, did you make it to eleven seventeen Betterton Betterton Circle? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you make contact with anyone there? Yes. Who did you make contact with? Um, two brothers. Um, one was Octavius Brown. Another one was William Brown. And did you have? Did you have an opportunity to talk to either of the Brown brothers? Yes. Okay. And um, in that discussion with the Brown brothers, what did y'all talk about? So um, the first discussion that I had was with, I believe, um, it was either William or Octavius. I can't really recall right now. But that um, discussion was about Ms. Botello. Um, I showed him the picture. So let me give you a rewind. So as we go to the house, he's kind of talking to me through the door. Um, so he steps out, so I show him the picture. I'm like, have you seen this young woman? Um, we're searching for this young woman right now. Um, and that's when he made uh, reference to saying that he saw this young lady two weeks ago over at the Shell gas station. And that's when I, I said, no, that's, that's impossible because, you know, she hasn't been here for that long at the moment. Um, and I, that's when his brother intervened and he started to tell us about, the, uh, about her being over at the Mustang Inn. Um, so had a little short discussion about that, um, and as we're leaving the residence, um, I started uh, looked to my right because there's a big lot over next door to the house. So um, there were three individuals that were in that lot. Um, there was a Shelly Smith, a um, Melinda Smith, and I believe a uh, Mr. Escobedo. Um, so I asked them the same question. I said, "Hey, have you seen this young lady?" And they were like, you know, we, we possibly saw her, we saw her. And I'm like, have you seen her or have you not seen her? Um, and that's when they like, yeah, we saw her. And I said, okay. And they told me she likes to hang out with the Mustang Inn as well. So from there, that's when we proceeded to the Mustang Inn. Um, as we're at the Mustang Inn, I encountered Miss um, Smith and Mr. Escobedo again. Um, and I asked them the follow up question one more time Have you seen this, this young lady? Um, and they're like, well, I think we like she likes to hang out at the city inn, which is not too far from the Mustang Inn. So I said, okay, we'll proceed over there. Once we got to the city inn, um, I noticed that they had a security guard, security officer over there. Um, Did you make contact with that security? Yes. Guard? Okay. Yes. And who was that security guard? Um, security officer's name was a Mr. Uh, Floyd Mitchell. Okay, and let me stop you for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, Officer Hayes. Um, Back in October of 2020, where you issued a body camera. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you have the body camera on you on this date? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Was the body camera activated when you made contact with these various witnesses? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so you met with a Floyd Mitchell who was the security officer at the city inn. Correct. Okay. And when you talked to Mr. Mitchell, did you activate your body camera? Yes. Okay. So when you talked to Mr. Mitchell, what did you ask him? Um, pretty much the same questions that I asked everyone else. Have you seen this young woman? 
um, she's been missing and you know do you have any information did you have a picture or anything to show mr. Mitchell yes I did okay did you show mr. Mitchell this picture yes what did mr. Mitchell do and say when you showed him the picture um he said he recognized her and he saw her um, said that he saw her on um, the night previously so that would have been October 12th mm, somewhere around there yep okay. um, oh, oh, could you? And, and what did you do next um, that's when um, I asked Mr. Mitchell, was it possible if we could, you know, search the, uh, the motel? Um, the motel in the city end is set up in tiers, so it's not just like you go in here and it's like a one floor type of thing. It's set up in tiers, so um, we proceeded to, you know, search the, uh, knock on, knock on the uh, hotel, motel door, excuse me, um, to see and ask residents if they saw this young woman, which no one did. Um, so when we get down to the, um, like it's like a little, what are you, like a vestibule type of entry area. Um, I asked Mr. Mitchell, can we, you know, possibly speak to um, the manager? Um, manager had no recollection of this young woman being there. Um, so I'm like, okay. Um, and then from there, you know, uh, we got a little bit more information from Mr. Mitchell saying that, you know, she like, she uh, uh, left that location and went down to the Valero gas station, which isn't too far from the city end. Did you, well, before we get to Valero, mm -hmm. when Mr. Mitchell told you he saw her, mm -hmm. um, did he appear to be credible in his belief that he saw her yes. there the night before? Yes. And what do you base that upon? Um, I just base it off of you know how he was giving me information. Um, one, he was he was very clear, very adamant that he saw her. Um, also, as a security guard, you know he sees a lot of people going in and out. Um, so when I showed him the picture, you know, I was pretty sure that, you know, he possibly saw her. Okay. So then you went to the Valero based mm -hmm. off of what Mr. Mitchell told you. Correct. Okay. And what happened when you got to the Valero gas station? And is this the Valero gas station located at 300 South Marcellus Avenue? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we go inside the Valero, um, talk to a couple of the workers um, at the Valero, um, asked them have they seen this woman. Um, they said no. Um, so after we got that information, we walked outside. There was a couple of uh, homeless people that like to hang out over there. Um, so naturally, I went over there and asked them because you know they see pretty much everything, and they had no recollection of seeing her um, at that location as well. Okay, um, but you showed everyone a picture of her. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you'll have to say yes or no. Oh yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. And um, basically, it sounds to me. Officer Hayes, is that you were following up, doing your job, following up with each lead that you had in trying to find Maricela Patea. Correct. Okay. Now, the body cam video that you had on and that you activated during these encounters mm -hmm. with the witnesses, including Mr. Mitchell, what's the process once your shift is over? What do you do with that body cam video? So immediately after our shift is over, if we're not using it for reference for reports, we dock our uh, body cam right in, there's a docking uh, area at every one of the stations. So as soon as you are done with your shift, you're in the tour, you go ahead and you dock your body camera. And what does it mean when you dock your body camera? Dock your body camera means that you load it up in a specific area so that information is processed through, um, through the accent. Okay. And the detective assigned to this case would have received your body cam videos? Correct. Uh, we passed the witness, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Um, officer Hayes, uh, how long have you been a police officer again? I'm sorry. A little over five years. Okay, and at this time you were uh, uh, just on patrol, and you said in, uh, is it Beat 7? Uh, Channel 7. That's, Channel uh, 7. Yes. Uh, okay, what area is that? That's uh, South Oak Cliff. Okay, and um, now you work down in Deep Ellum, is that right? Correct. What do you do down at? Um, I'm part of the Deep Task Force. Okay, and as part of the Deep Ellum Task Force, are you guys just, uh, I guess, having more presence, more police presence down in that location? Correct. And you work uh, 6 p.m. to, what, what's your shift? So my shift is Thursday through Saturday, 6 p.m. through 4 a.m. On Sunday, we come in at uh, 4 p.m. and we are off at 2 a.m. Okay, and Deep Ellum, I mean, it's known for a lot of bars and restaurants and things of that nature. Correct. And in fact, uh, they're kind of, uh, I guess, making an attempt, and Dallas is making an attempt, because that's a very, 
very popular hangout location to uh, one, increase security and also, um, I guess, have new businesses and bars and things like that. Correct. Okay, make it, make it a, a more enjoyable experience for everybody, a safer experience, uh, all of those things. Okay. Now, um, at this time, you were working down in South Oak Cliff, is that right? Correct. And when you got a call uh, for a welfare check, that wasn't from an individual. Like the, the Brown brothers didn't call you out there for a welfare check. No, ma'am. Um, in fact, uh, several officers were sent out, uh, responding officers, patrol officers like yourself, to just check various locations that um, maybe a young person might go to if they just didn't want to go home. Correct. Okay. And uh, this is one of those areas that you just went and checked. Correct. Um, at the direction of a sergeant. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, now, you stated that the original location that you checked, that's a known drug house, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, and that made you kind of proceed with a little bit of caution. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Willie Brown and Orlando Brown, they, uh, one of the brothers, and you're not sure which one, came out and, and talked to you for a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Do you recall them saying that this person was uh, that they saw uh, was hanging out and had asked for $2? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you knew that, um, um, it, again, you knew this was to be uh, a drug house, a place known for, for people coming up and purchasing uh, drugs from that location, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, at that point, you showed the picture, and uh, were they 100% certain or just kind of certain that they saw it? They were certain. Okay. And, uh, you may approach? You may. Stage three, is this the photograph that you showed them? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, in that photograph, this individual, Marisol Vitello, she's wearing a, like a purple dress, right? Correct. And it uh, looks like a, a common dress you might see a young lady of that size and stature wearing down in Deep Ellum, right? Correct. Okay. And, and to be fair, the area that you are uh, searching in these uh, hotels, the City Inn, the Mustang Inn, I mean, they're known for prostitution and drugs and things of that nature, right? Correct. Uh, did you have any background information about Maricela other than the fact that she was supposed to go back to Seattle? No, no background information. All the information that we received was on our way to that call. Okay, so it's just a photograph and that she was supposed to be back in Seattle on the 5th and she didn't show up? Correct. Okay, so you didn't know that she had uh, a family waiting for her back at home? Absolutely not. You didn't no. know that she had a stable home life? No. You didn't know that she uh, more than likely had to go to work as an assistant manager of the Charlotte Roost in Seattle on Tuesday? No. Uh, you didn't know that she had several family uh, or friends in um, Seattle that were very concerned about the fact that her social media and her um, phone contact had completely stopped? Correct. No. You didn't know that she had a bank account full of money? No. Um, a person with a bank account full of money doesn't need to borrow two dollars, do they? Sure don't, no. Um, this area, the city inn and the uh, Mustang inn, like you said, I mean, it's known for prostitution and drugs and things of that nature. Correct. The person that I just described to you, that background information, does that like, sound like a person that is going to be hanging out in that area? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may I approach? Okay. <coughs> I'm showing you has been marked States Exhibit 396 and 397. Are those uh, photographs of both the City Inn and the Mustang Inn? This is the City Inn right here. Um, this right here looks like an updated version of the Mustang Inn, but yes. Okay. And uh, States 396, that's the one that's the City Inn, and the 397 is the Mustang Inn, correct? Correct. Okay. And you said an updated version. Does that look like it has, a, has had a paint job since you went out there? Um, yes. Your Honor, uh, state moves to admit states 396 and 397 for all purposes entering to defense counsel. No objection. All right, state exhibits 396 and 397 are admitted for all purposes. Permission to publish, Your Honor. You may. Uh, and states 396, this is the city, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and that's just located, is it just right off of uh, 67? Or no, uh, 35. 35, right before uh, 35 and 67 split? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, 
And this is the Mustang unit, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Is that near that same location? Up the street, yes, ma'am. Up the street. Okay. So we're not talking about uh, a nice hotel, um, you know, a, a Hilton or a Marriott or anything like that? No, ma'am. And for a person that's never been to Dallas, it, it seems like that would be a, a very unusual place to go spend your time. Correct. The people that you talk to, I mean, they're trying to help, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you been out on calls like this where you're just trying to locate somebody? Yes, ma'am. And, I mean, it's, it's common for people to give tips that just don't pan out, right? Correct. Um, and you never talk to these people about, hey, this, this girl's name is, you know, did you, let me back up. You never ask these people, did you talk to her? Did you ask her about her background? Did you ask her where she was from? You didn't have that conversation with these no, people. No, ma'am. And of the people that uh, may have seen her, the Brown brothers that, that live in the drug <laughs> house um, said, yeah, we think we saw her. Um, and then Floyd Mitchell, uh, who works security, right? Correct. And it's fair to say that uh, there's a large population of five foot tall, um, early 20s, Hispanic female, about 100 pounds. I mean, that, that demographic is quite common. Correct. And um, a vast majority of those have long, dark hair. Correct. Um, and it's quite possible that these individuals just trying to help um, didn't see Maricela Botello, but saw someone very like her. Correct. Ask the witness. Oh, redirect, Your Honor. You may. But that didn't keep you from doing your job, which was to follow up on these leads, because you didn't know about Maricela's background, correct? correct. You didn't know that a week earlier, she left the Deep Ellum area with some man she did not know to go do drugs. Correct. Okay. And um, let me ask you this about people using drugs and then also people being forced into possible human trafficking. Um, it's not unusual for people from all different backgrounds for that to happen to. Correct. Uh, okay. And um, when these things happen, they're not going to be at the Omni Hotel, usually, correct? Correct. You'll, you're going to find them in the more seedier parts of town. Yes. Okay. Um, but you didn't know anything that led up to Maricela's disappearance. All you knew was that this was a health, a, a, a wellness check, mm -hmm. health and safety. Health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Health and wellness check and you were following up doing your job. Correct. And you did your job properly. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Pass the witness, Your Honor. No further questions, Your Honor. May this witness be found? Yes, Your Honor. No objection from the state. Thank you, sir. You're free to leave the back to Thank you, ma'am. Call your next witness. Uh, we call Floyd Mitchell, Your Honor. Floyd Mitchell. Okay. And Mr. Mitchell, back in October of 2020, what did you do for a living? Security. Where did you um, work security at? The front gate. Where? At City Inn. Okay. And where is City Inn located? It, uh, it's a 35 in Eden. Okay. And is that in Dallas? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
And what type of motel is City in? Yeah, it's a tough motel. It's a what? It's kind of a drug motel. It's a drug motel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Mitchell, on October 13th, 2020, do you remember talking to uh, a Dallas police officer about a missing person? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What do you remember about that? I just told him I had seen him around that day. The, around which day? Uh, 12th, something like that, I think it was. Uh, around October 12th, 2020? Yeah. Uh -huh. Did the police officer show you a picture? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, in the picture, may I approach you? Mr. Mitchell, is this the picture that you remember the police officer showing you? Yeah. On the 13th? Yeah. Okay. And when the officer asked you if you had seen this young lady, what did you tell the officer? I had seen her at, at, at that date when she, when she came through the building. And were you, were you for sure, were you adamant that you had seen her? Yeah, I, told, I, I seen her, but I won't, uh, I seen her that, that, that day, but that's the only time I ever seen her. That's the only time you ever saw her? Yeah. Okay, and what hours did you work back I, then, Mr. Mitchell? 10, uh, 10 in the evening to 5 o'clock in, in, in the morning. Okay. Did you tell um, the officer anything else about this young lady? No. Okay. Um, you don't remember telling the officer that you saw her walking towards Valero gas station? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. And I understand this was about three years. It yeah, was I know. Quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, so you do remember telling the officer you saw her going to Valero yeah. gas station. Uh -huh. okay. But this was the first and the last time you ever saw her. Yeah. Okay. Pass the witness, Your Honor. Proximity. Briefly, Your Honor. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Mitchell. How are you? I'm oh, fine. Good. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I just had a few questions about um, your interaction uh, with this person that you saw, okay? And a little bit about your time at the city inn, okay? Okay. Uh, you described this as a drug hotel, is that correct? Or a drug motel? Yeah. And you have a lot of uh, traffic in and out of there, is that right? Yeah. Okay, you have a lot of uh, different individuals uh, that come in uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Uh, over the course of just say a month in October, um, I mean, you may have hundreds of different individuals that you're seeing walking around the city in, coming in, checking in, things like that. Yeah. Uh, it's also known for uh, prostitution, things like that. Yeah. Okay, and, and there's a, a large um, population of uh, young Hispanic females that come through there, is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, small in stature, uh, pretty girls? No, they average. Average? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, on this particular uh, case or in this particular situation, um, this officer, you know, came and asked you about the, the girl in that picture, right? If you'd yeah. And had you seen a, a young Hispanic girl in a purple dress that day? Uh, the, the day, maybe, maybe not. Cause the most they come through. The, well, I'm at the gate. Uh, if they not uh, living there, we have to you know where they try. We won't let them in the gate unless they're walking with somebody. Okay. Was this person walking with somebody? That day, when we came through, uh, we tried, like I said, I turned around because she wasn't with nobody. Okay. And did you talk to her? Uh, we just said, you don't. Uh, do you have room here? That's what we know. Ask. They said no. We tell them they can't come on at ten o'clock. They can't come on the property. Okay. And was this late when this person was there? Yeah. Okay. Um, but you didn't ask for her name or where no. she's from or anything like that. No. Okay. And as far as uh, what uh, your conversation with the officer, did he give you any information about uh, the girl that he was looking for? He just said they were looking for. Her. Okay. Yeah. He didn't tell you that she was. Uh, been in Seattle or came from Seattle. I can't remember he did not, but he said they were looking for her. Okay. Um, and then you pointed him over to the Valero. Were you aware that none of the people at the Valero remember seeing that 
that girl that Because most of them, when they come to, uh, they, that's most where they go.
see him back there, but you may have went to the restroom. Mr. Sadler? Yes. Um, Mr. All right. Go ahead and uh, state your name for the record. Um, my name is Lisa Dykes. And can I approach it? You may. Uh, you have a very soft voice, so I want you to make sure you keep your voice up and speak sure. into the microphone, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So the members of the jury can hear everything you have to say. Can you do that for me? Of course. We've heard a lot of what Charles Beltran, Chuck Fifty Fifty, had to say. And now it's your opportunity, right? Yes, sir. All right. Um, but before we go into um, the things that Chuck testified to, um, I want to talk about you first. Can you tell members of the jury um, I am 60 years <laughs> old. I was hesitating because you're not supposed to ask a woman how old they are, right? No, that's perfectly okay. I'm okay. 60 years old. All right. Um, Ms. Dykes, uh, let's talk about, we heard a lot about you being a, uh, I guess, paralegal. Um, tell them of the jury, where were you born? I was born in Somerset, Kentucky. Okay. And at some point, we're not going to go over your whole history, all the husbands, how many husbands you had? I've had, I've had three husbands, and oh. then, of course, I'm married to Nina. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. um, many of them uh, relationships you kind of want to forget about? Um, I would like to forget about all three of the relationships with the men that I've been married to, quite frankly. Okay. Uh, let's fast forward and let's just get to the point. Uh, you were working at the time in uh, 
Let's talk about 2020. Let's start there. Okay. But before we do, do that, I did want to briefly um, talk about your, your children as well. Yes, sir. Uh, how many kids do you have? I have three. Three? And what are your, your, your children like? Uh, Chelsea, who's mm -hmm. 40. And the state talked about her earlier, right? Yes, they did. Okay, who else? Aaron, who's 39, mm -hmm. and Kyle, who's 34. All right. Um, as far as them being present, kids, you have concerns for their safety? Absolutely. I would not want them and don't want them exposed to having the same issues that Maricela experienced. Chuck is a violent man, and I don't want anything to happen to them. Okay. Um, and in fact, we'll talk about that, but I also want the members of the jury to understand that before you met Charles Beltran, you had a life, right? Absolutely. I had and a good life. I had a good life. And everyone is trying, or it seems like the witnesses that have testified are making it seem like you were dependent on me. No, that's actually not true. I've been a litigation paralegal for 34 years, so I always had a glass ceiling in my income. Nina actually made um, about the same amount of money that I did, and she's an attorney, so I was making quite quite a good salary at what I do. Okay. Like, I do the litigation work, so it, it pays well. Okay, as far as uh, Nina, uh, what type of attorney was she? Nina was actually working for the city of New York, so she was working for a governmental agency, which doesn't pay as well as private sector anyway. So she was working for the city of New York doing housing work, so she did in a different area of law than me too. So it's not the same, it's, it's not similar. Okay, and, and just while we're on the subject, um, Nina, uh, they said that she was married to William or Bill. Yes. Uh, he subsequently passed. He did. Uh, when Bill passed, where were they living? Um, they weren't living in Pennsylvania, as you've heard before. Nina and Bill had a house that was in Staten Island. That house was way overfinanced and upside down, basically is the best way to describe that house. The house that was in Pennsylvania was a house that Nina bought and paid for, and she paid $60,000 for the house. Okay, now so when you say the house that was in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. that wasn't a house that uh, her and Bill lived in, right? No, they, okay. they paid very little money for this house. That was a four-bedroom house, four-bedroom, three-bath. But the house was in poor condition, so they would only go there, and Nina would go sometimes by herself on the weekend, but she didn't live there. They did not reside there. Okay, and the other interesting thing, that house was in the same neighborhood that her parents were in. It was, it was abutting. So it was exactly like the lots almost met. From the upstairs bedroom window, Nina's bedroom window, you could see Nina's mom and dad's house. So it was right there. Okay, and I just want to briefly touch base on that. As far as Nina and her parents, mm -hmm. uh, she didn't have a good relationship with her parents, right? They had been alienated from the time Nina was like 15 or 16. They spoke, but it was very seldom, and they were not close. And this was um, something that gave Nina a lot of concern. She was emotionally, like, very much wanting to have that family back. So one of the reasons that she bought this house was so that she would be able to see them and possibly reconnect. All right, did y'all invest a lot of money in that house? Yes. Um, Nina had decided to put the house on the market in like April or maybe even March before she and I got married. So she couldn't afford to borrow the money because she was upside down at the house in Staten Island. She was trying to sell it so that we could get out from underneath that mortgage because it was large. So she couldn't afford to, to fund the money or to borrow the money to fix this house to put it on the market. So whenever we got married, one of the first things that I did was fly up there and we borrowed the money so that we could fix the house, put it on the market and sell it. Okay, and um, I'm going over all that because this notion that you were with her just for her money, is that true? No, absolutely not. Like, um, we both brought money to the table. God blessed us both in being able to make a good living and it was something that the marriage made us more solid financially, but I, I didn't need Nina to pay bills. Nina didn't need, need me to pay bills. We're together primarily because we, we actually love each other. I've known Nina for 16 years today. 
I knew Nina for 13 years before we got married. So we had been best friends that whole time. All right, and, and, and I want to get to the point, but I also want to make sure the jury understands, uh, as far as Nina's relationship with Bill, it wasn't a good relationship, was it? It was a horrible relationship. Mm -hmm. it was, he was abusive. Um, he did all kinds of things like stalking her in the area where she was staying. When they split and separated, Nina stayed in Pennsylvania. But Bill was like, like you had heard testimony before, he was parking on the street behind the house. So he was watching her in that house in Pennsylvania. All right, and the only reason I'm making reference to, because you got two women who basically had bad history with me. Very, mm -hmm. very. And at some point y'all befriend each other, fall in love. Well, we love each other. We love each other like sisters. Like this is a unique relationship. Um, I think we might think about marriage, Nina and I do, maybe differently than the average person. Not every marriage is based on sex or, you know, that physical connection. Nina and I are supportive of each other in every way other than that. Like, we love each other like a sister. We love each other, like, truly. Like, anything that Nina's going through, I want to help her with that. Anything I'm going through, Nina wants to help me with that. Okay, let me, let me stop you there because uh, I want to make sure we continue to move on, but I mean, that's very important, yes. but this, um, y'all made a decision to, uh, after y'all got married, to go by Lisa and Nina Beltran. Can mm -hmm. you explain to the members of the jury uh, how that decision came about? Yes. Um, my last name is slang, basically. A dyke is slang for a gay woman, and it would be just a horrible name for us to take as a last name for us. Pennsylvania allows you to change your name to any name that you choose to whenever you get married. So when we looked at the names that we wanted to take as a last name, Dykes is right out of the picture. So Murano is not really a name that we wanted to take because of her relationship with Bill. So we looked at other names of people that were around us or, or names that were of interest, and Beltran was an interesting name. It means raven in Spanish, and it has a history, and it's just, it was a better name. We asked Chuck if he had a problem with us taking it. It was not in any kind of connection to him, but it was just a name that appealed to both of us, so we took that name. So you didn't take that name because y'all were obsessed with Charles Beltran? Absolutely not. All right, let's move forward. Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, you abruptly leaving your employer. Was it abrupt? I had problems with my employer, yes, um, from from certain standpoint issues of, of bonusing. Okay, and when you say bonusing, basically uh, you as a paralegal are doing all the work, because this was um, car wreck cowboy stuff, right? Yes. Uh, these are car wrecks. Yes. Y'all, you were working these cases. Absolutely. But he's making all the money. Absolutely. Now, were there other cases that you were working on with him as well? Yes. Um, in particular, we started to have an issue with a case that I had brought in, and I brought it in from my contact. It was a case that was wrongful death. And in personal injury, wrongful death cases settle for a considerable sum of money. Like, one of the bonusing structures that we had when we brought these cases in was a percentage of the settlement, right? This particular case settled for $3 million, over, a little over that. Okay, let me stop you there, just so the members of the jury know, uh, who'd you get that case from? A friend of mine, contact for mine, and she testified here. Her name was Catherine Delion. The hairdresser? Absolutely. Okay. Right. Absolutely. And she didn't get as much money as she thought she should get out of it. She did. surely did not. All right, but anyway, the bottom line is you were having issues with you making all the money, or you making all the money, but the attorney getting all the money. Yes, and, and not paying the percentage of of bonus that I should receive. All right, and during this time period, um, this early October, late September, uh, did you have uh, plastic surgery? I did. All right, we have medical records to support that, don't we? Yes, you do. All right, um, as a result of the plastic surgery, um, were you on medication for the pain? Yes, I definitely was. And, and, and did that affect your uh, 
Good point. It did. Um, I could I couldn't be there, which was essential. I was at that point in time doing the negotiations for the firm. So if I couldn't make my nut, which that's a strange term, but if I couldn't meet the quota of settlements that we had, like the money for payroll was going to come out of save money back. So I needed to be there with the surgery. I could not be there like I needed to be. And I also, like my focus wasn't as good as it should be whenever you're taking pain meds like hydrocodone, which I was taking at the time. Okay, and did that have a lot with, to do with uh, you uh, eventually leaving? It did. All right. Um, as far as your, um, this surgery, uh, tell me the jury what, what type of surgery you had to do. There were two procedures that I had done, and it was a wedding gift for Mina, so I'll, I'll tell you that. Like, I had lost a considerable amount of weight, so I had extra skin is the easiest way to explain it, and no tightness, like, in my thighs in particular. So I had a procedure done on both legs called a thighplasty, and in that procedure, a triangle of flesh is actually cut out in the center part of the leg and then stitched back together to make your leg tighter and smoother, right? And I also had a lower facelift done because I, I had extra skin here. So I had both procedures done at once. Okay, were these procedures extremely painful? They were. Um, my thighplasty ended up being a, a failed procedure. It, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Whenever he took the skin and tissue out, he took out too much. So when he closed it back, that, that first day it was okay while well, I was still in, in the facility. And it was a plastic surger, surgery center that had an in-house like hospital kind of setting. So you stayed that day and then you were released home the next day. The very first day I went home, all of the sutures started popping out, first in the left leg and then in the right. And it was immediate. So it was first like three or four and then it was five and then all of them. So I called the doctor, he told me to come back. I had to actually get an Uber to go back because Chuck was supposed to have been available to help take care of me some because Nina was in trial work. So I didn't want her to lose the, tri the trial work in New York. It should have been an easier procedure than what it was, but the complications happened. All right, and as far as the, the complications that you're referring to, uh, do we in fact have some photos of that? You do. Um, here's my phone. Okay. I got one. Uh, let me show you what's marked as defense exhibit number 10. Uh, are these the medical records that we put on file with the court? assist you in uh, testifying to the members of the jury of the extent of the injury that you had during that time period? Yes. Okay. And the Uber ride back to the doctor's office that you're referring to happened when? The uh, very first day post, post the surgery. So okay. it was the first day I was home. So that would have been what day? I think these surgeries were performed. Too. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, I think the surgeries were performed like on September 10th, I think. So it had been September the 11th. Okay, so September the 11th. Uh -huh. uh, can you show me, well, Judge, I'll offer what's marked as a uh, defense team. Uh, but if anyone has any questions about the extent of the injuries you had to your thighs, 
Uh, these photos depict that, do they not? Absolutely. Uh, um, and even in October, uh, I think we made reference to you guys going to the um, to Arkansas. Were you having issues with your legs at that time? Yes. All right, and I wanted to ask you specifically uh, about the, the trip to Arkansas. How did y'all end up going to Arkansas? Um, the trip to Arkansas was unplanned. Whenever I had this procedure initially done, Dr. Armijo had told me that the surgery would be, my legs would be the best they were going to be at three weeks. So this was exactly three weeks post the surgery, right? Okay. So um, Nina and I had planned to go to California. We had tickets to fly to Los Angeles for that weekend, for October 4th. Were you able to fly to Los Angeles? No, I, Why had, not? I had a doctor's appointment with Dr. Armijo that Friday before this weekend. He told me absolutely under no circumstance should I fly. So they were that bad that I, I couldn't really travel by plane with them because plane and the pressure in, in the plane itself was gonna cause that to be a lot worse. It would increase bleeding, it would increase the difficulties that I was having with it and worsen them. Okay, um, but as far as the incisions, what what is this photo I'm looking at right here? That's actually open fat tissue because there was no skin. I had no, like the skin just there wasn't enough to cover the wound, so the the actual incision started to open in the beginning on the first day, and there's actually pictures of that too. Okay, so this reflects what. This what? is, yeah, this is what it was like, and there's still, you can see on the edge, a few of the sutures that were left, those actually were completely gone. Commissioner Public Church. You're not saying that uh, on October 1st your leg was uh, opened up like this, right? Oh, it was. Okay. It was? It was, yes. Okay. Like I had started to use, um, I had to use special bandaging for this and special like treatment, wound treatment. So there's a, a particular chemical called hydroferrous blue that's on like a sponge bandage that I had to order through my plastic surgeon for it to be applied to grow skin. So I still had no skin at that time. Okay, so, but you, you, you had bandages on them. I did, I had to change them frequently, but I had them. Because they would bleed? They would bleed and they would also weep serous fluid. So it would weep white blood cells. All right, now as far as, I mean, can you explain to the members with the court's permission, can she, um, Kind of, I mean, explain to the members of the jury where, where your injuries were. They're exactly in the groin. Like, okay. it's right at the top. Like, they make a Y incision at the top of your groin, and then it goes all the way down the inside of your leg to a couple of inches above, above your knee. The place where I had no skin was right in the crotch. Right, so right, right in this there, area. Right there, yep. And would you have to have that bandage? There were four layers that had to go on. All right, all the way down? Uh, yep, to, to cover it to about, uh, about two inches, three inches above your knee. Okay. But again, if they want to see the extent of what this surgery, uh, the damage, what is this I'm looking at here? That's actually the wound as it's starting to grow some skin. Okay. So, but when would this be? That's what it looks like without the bandage? Yeah, that's what it looks like without the bandage after it started to actually smooth out just a little and this is all brand new skin and serous fluid. Okay, so in the beginning of October, do these pictures accurately re reflect what your wound would have looked like post-surgery? They do. Permission to publish now? Right. Why you were taking the hydrocodone for the pain? 
on a scale of one to 10, I used to think having a baby would be, it was 10, right? With this particular injury, where this was and pain factor involved, this is a 10 and having a baby is five. Okay. So that gives you an idea of what that was in dealing with it. Okay, so just so I'm clear, Because of this surgery, um, what about your, the face? What? The face was still an issue. Like, I wasn't supposed to bend over. Like, you, you can't really bend over like this whenever you've got, like, surgery to the lower part of your face. Um, the pain from it was not as bad. I was a little surprised that my ear wasn't attached on the right side whenever I came home. So... I had a few things going on with that, and the wounds were still raw and open, but... Yeah, of course it is. Okay. Remember the um, October picture uh, that the... Oh, Lord. Have one moment, John. Yeah. I'm gonna keep these in order so you don't kill me. <laughs> Why, why was why was your hair pink like that? <laughs> you know, do you recall? I do kind of recall that. Like I was looking for something fairly lively, and Cat actually picked that color out for me. And when you say Cat, you're referring to the hairdresser, right? Catherine Delion. Okay. On the photo that she put up that they were using, and she was testifying. With you and the pink hair. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, that photo actually shows uh, the injuries that, that you're referring to, doesn't it? It does. Mark the states exhibit number um, 86. Yes. Okay. Uh, where do you see the, um, I guess? It's right it's at the hairline right here. And this is what you're referring to here? The scar that went right there. And also, there's a scar back here you can see. Right. Okay. And then I had another one under my chin, and I think you can see a little bit of that. Okay. This is the publish, uh, under my chin there's a stitch you can see it and you can see that if you really look closer mm -hmm. you can see the stitches mm -hmm. in your chin right? yes sir all right and so you're not only dealing with um, the facelift surgery you're dealing with your thighs as well yes sir okay and that affect your work performance correct it did I mean, it, it affect your activity period it affected everything 
But the doctor told you they might do that, right? He did. And so, as far as a lot of the restrictions you had, you definitely had restrictions, and or you, you should have been watching what you lift. You couldn't lift anything at all. And why like, is that? Because it could cause, on a normal surgery, even lifting was prohibited, because it could cause all of this to come loose again, as far as the facelift goes, and it would also cause strain in your thighs and cause them to open too. That's not the reason mine did, but it could cause that complication. Okay. All right. Um, before we start talking more about uh, Charles Beltran, I did want to, you know, these people talk about you basically look like you had a midlife crisis or something like that. Remember Jimmy, your brother Jimmy? Yes. Saying that? Yes. All right. Let's, I want, can you talk about the blood clot problems you had before you met um, Charles Beltran? Yes, sir, I can. Um, in my 40s, I had an unusual medical condition that popped up. Like, I'm really driven to work. Like, I've raised three kids by myself. So, me working has just always been who I am. It's how I, it's how I, I relate to life, I guess. So I work more than I should. But I had been working a lot, so I ended up having a very unusual aortic blood clot. Now, aortic blood clot, what are those? Um, the aorta sits right underneath the heart, right? So it's under here. So this means that a blood clot had to pass literally through my heart and lodge in this particular area of the body, which is what it did. So I had some very unusual symptoms in like stomach pain as opposed to what you would think. Whenever I went to the hospital, the blood clot had shattered. So it blocked almost every major like organ in my body. My, my kidneys, my liver, my large intestines, and both of my legs. So how long were you in the hospital as a result of this blood clot? 30 days, right at 30 days. Um. Was the, were these life-threatening injuries? Absolutely. They thought, they told my, actually they told my children and me that I had about a 25% chance of living. If I did live through it, it was anticipated that I would be a double amputee because they knew they were going to have to cut off my legs from at least the knee down, if not more. Why? Because of the damage from no blood flow. I basically had zero blood flow. So that was a problem. So but somehow they rectified the situation, you didn't lose your legs. They didn't rectify anything. Actually, um, my body pretty much dissolved the blood clot for the most part, and thank God, like, I, I managed to come out and I, I was okay for 10 years. Then here in Texas, that first one happened when I was living in Florida. 10 years later, I am also in a position where I'm under a lot of pressure. And I was working trying to settle another case of a quadriplegic. So just so the members of the jury are clear, that's the first time you had a blood clot. It's the first time. Ten years later, you had another blood clot. Yeah, clock. approximately six years ago, I had another one. So the second one was also an aortic blood clot, did the same thing. Like, it, it was shattered. I had blood clots everywhere, all through my body. So they airlifted me from Mesquite to Dallas to Baylor Scott White where it was the same situation again. Like, I was in risk of dying from that point. Obviously, I was airlifted, so, like, it wasn't a good situation, but I'm, I'm here. You survived. I am. After you survived that death scare, I mean, how does that affect your life? I think it affects any, everything. Like, whenever you come that close, not once, I mean, once is enough, but twice, I think you have to reevaluate your life like what you're looking for in life, if you're where you need to be in life, and, and you know, you think about what's going to happen to your children and your future at that All right, point. So, so at that time, did you reevaluate uh, what you were doing and, and what things you wanted to do in life? Absolutely. And um, so what, what happened after that? I've raised children, I feel like, from the time I was born. Like, you know, my kids are older. 
but they've always been with me and I've always been spending money on them. There's never enough money. It's gone before you get it. So my retirement wasn't right. It just, it wasn't where it needed to be. I obviously needed to start putting money back for retirement and get my life straight for that. And yeah. plus, I don't want to work all the time. Like, right. I didn't want to work all the time. So did you, you heard Jimmy say you kicked everybody out? That's what's, a, what, what's your version of that? That's, that's not correct. <laughs> like, I wanted to go back home to Florida. Like, Texas is great, I'm sure, but I, I'm from Florida primarily. I wanted to go back home. So the whole goal was for me to move the family back to Florida while I was waiting on some larger cases to settle so that I would have more cash flow. So we invested. I gave them the money for a down payment on a house. They bought the house. I helped to get them there. Paid off my son's car so that he would be able to help pay that payment and put them in the house in Florida. So your plan was always to go back to Florida? Absolutely. Okay. Um, And at some point, you and Nina wanted to go back to Florida. It was always our intent to go back to Florida. In um, fact, did you have a business there? We did. We opened a business during COVID, a, a law firm together that was doing personal injury, and it was doing well. Okay. All right. Um, tell us how you met uh, Charles Beltran. He was working for my son, Kyle as a bouncer at a bar in Debello. I was actually looking for um, workers to work at poll, an election poll, for a local judge here in the civil divisions. And I needed, I think, 15 people under a certain age and demographic bracket to work this poll. So Kyle introduced me to several of the young men that are in the area and young women, and I got their phone numbers, they got my phone number to work this situation. Okay. Uh, how did you end up investing in draft plans? I'm sorry? How did you end up investing in uh, <coughs> Chuck's rep for it? Um, I met him in April. He reached out to me at some point. And he reached out to me to make connection. And it was primarily for someone to fund him in his career choices. Um, he he actually talked to me from April on through the time whenever I moved the children out of the house in August. But he presented himself well. He also had had a fairly successful career in Austin. Not like what you heard here that was played. It was actually something where he was invited to a couple of locations and he was working with other people in his career. So perhaps they were the more talented aspect, but he had a more successful kind of career choice. But were you, you know, initially, again, was it a love interest thing? No. Chuck was and continued to always be a business interest that went sideways. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, was the, why did you buy the car? I bought the car as an investment um, and a tax deduction, basically for him in his career. I set up a company for him called Math Class. That was his company for him to be able to do this music and to record. I mean, y'all helped him with a lot of legal stuff, right? We did. Uh, and, and before I forgot, the, the, uh, he had paternity issues. He did. Jasmine. He had paternity issues with Jasmine and he had visitation mm -hmm. issues with Emerald. Okay. Out of Austin. And were y'all helping him with that? Yes, at his request. At his request? Yes. Um, any notion about you trying to steal Jasmine's baby? I raised three. I don't want any more babies. I okay. would never. All right. Um, I want to move forward and let's just get to the point uh, this trip to uh, Arkansas um, first I think you indicated it wasn't even a scheduled trip not for me and Nina how did you end up going on the trip 
Um, we had paid for them to go. We had paid for the hotel. We had paid for all of it for them to actually perform. It was a performance. Um, when we couldn't fly to California, Chuck had two tickets that were his that were comp tickets. And he said, well, you know, who would I take but you two? Like, you've, you know, funded this. You're part of it. So, will you go? It was like a, about a four-hour ride, I think. So that's something that I could I could tolerate as long as I'm sitting down or laying down. That's okay. I could do that. Now you heard um, Dax and everybody said you were driving. Is that true? No, I was in the passenger seat and it was reclined. Okay. So who was driving? Dina was driving. Okay. Um, when y'all are down in Arkansas, uh, you heard I think it was Freddie. They were joking about. Chuck having to come to your room to, to have sex with y'all. Did he have come to your room and have sex with y'all? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, but did he come to the room and have a drink? I think he might have. I think he did. When y'all finished, when y'all, do you remember when y'all got back to Dallas? I don't remember exactly what time it was, but we checked out at about 11-ish. So I think it's a four hour drive, which would put us mid afternoon. Okay, um, as far as uh, when y'all get back, who takes the van back? Nina and I took the van back. You didn't trust Chuck to take the van back? Absolutely not. Okay, so y'all take the van back? Yes. All right. uh, once you take the van back, do you, do you recall what y'all did up at that point? I don't specifically. I think we stopped and got food and went home and watched TV. Um, and that would be October the 4th, right? That, yes, that sir. Sunday. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, and I forgot. We had to go pick up the dog because we had boarded him. Right. So we went and got the dog. And tell us about this dog. Uh, Chuck had brought home a dog. What type of dog? He was a pit bull mix. And, and the dog's name was uh, Uniquely Charles. Okay. So... Uh, who took care of that dog? I did. Did, did uh, Chuck take care of the dog at all? The dog hated Chuck. Absolutely. Um, when he brought the dog home, he said that he wanted it for some protection house, extra protection house. And he initially, the dog was okay with him for a while, but Chuck used to beat the dog. So the dog started to get to a point where he was growling every time Chuck was around. He was not having Chuck around. And where did that dog stay? He slept in my bed. He stayed. Nina, 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 well, when Nina was there, did she sleep in the bed with you? Yes. All right. Um, did, um, was he almost like a service dog to you? He was like a comfort animal, more than a service dog. So he, he stayed with us all the time. But you took care of him? I took care of him. And so when y'all went to Arkansas, y'all boarded him? We boarded him for that day. And when you got the dog? We went and got the dog. Anything else uneventful happened on that, I guess, Sunday? Not Did at you all. Recall? Not at all. Okay. Um, now, during that time period, was, was Nina working on a uh, big case? Yes. Just as I had said, she had um, a particularly large case with a building that was in the city where the elevators were failing off and on. So all of the tenants and the tenant association was really upset with it. Okay. And was she receiving and sending, uh, I guess, packages back and forth? Yes, in particular discovery. So she was in um, a process of discovery on this with maintenance records and dealing with the maintenance people that work for the city of New York with this building. Okay. Um, on that weekend, she's working on her case. Was she anticipating some documents? She was. Uh, I guess that Monday, was she still looking for the documents? Yes, they were supposed to come in, I think, Monday morning in early delivery, but they didn't show. Okay, because the documents didn't show, what, what did, what did y'all do for well, we were kind of in dire straits because Nina really needed them because when she flew back, she had like, a hearing, I think. So it was something that we had to have. 
So she started to look for where the documents were. All right. In short, later that evening, did y'all go to a FedEx? We did. All right. Um, and you've seen the, um, we talked about the FedEx that, that you went to. Uh, it wasn't in Wilma, was it? I don't believe it was, no. It was more toward the Hutchins area, maybe? Okay. They, um, It was one of the larger distribution centers in the area. Like it's it's like a, a major kind of hub area. So it's one of the bigger ones. And is it all 45 though? I, I believe it is, yes. not in Hutchins, right? I mean, it's not in Wilmer, but it's in Hutchins. I think so. And is it in that same vicinity that they're, they're saying that your phone's pinged? I believe it is.
We did, yes. Like back in 2016, right? Yes. Uh, is that how you know about this FedEx distribution center up in Hutchins? It is. I used to work in downtown Dallas for uh, another law firm, obviously, and I, I pay attention to where these FedEx centers are because they use them a lot. So it's part of what I do. And a lot of times you have to drop off and you need a place that's a bigger facility that has longer hours or you know that it'll ship quicker. So I always pay attention to those things. Okay, now, uh, as far as this facility was concerned, y'all were picking up. Yes. Or Nina was picking up. Nina was picking up for Mark, yes. They had sent her a package that she needed. Okay, and she had been trying to locate that package. She did try, um, but it's so hard and she needed it really quick. So like tracking it electronically wasn't working like it needed to. So it just made sense to go someplace and get some help with it. All right, now when y'all go down to this di distribution center, um, well, if I told you that the address was uh, 1101 East Cleveland Road in Hutchins, Texas, would that be about right? Yeah, I believe so, yes. And how, how far would you say that that's from your house? I think it's probably a 20, 25 minute drive, maybe. From Mesquite? Yes. Just hit 635, hit 20, boom, you're there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Um, may I approach you? You may. Let me show you what's marked as um, defense exhibit number 1112. Yes, ma'am. Let me show you what's marked as defense exhibit number 11 and uh, 12. Uh, does this look like a, I mean, it's just a map quest where we pulled up that location uh, in relation to <coughs> your home and where that FedEx distribution center is? Yes, sir. Uh, will this assist you in uh, testifying to the members of the jury the route that you recall y'all taking that day? It does, yes. All right. Judge Allah, of course, marked as defense exhibit number 11 and defense 12. somewhere up in here, right? Yes, sir. And then y'all travel to Hudson's here? Yes, sir. All right. Now, do you recall when y'all got on uh, 45, uh, what exit were y'all supposed to take? I don't know the number, but it's like Dowdy Ferry. Um, let me show you what's marked as Defense 13. Uh, I mean, Defense 12, I'm sorry. And is this Dowdy Ferry here? Yes, sir. Um, and just so the members of the jury know, when you come out 45, you loop and come in this area here, that's where the distribution center is? Yes, it's someplace back in there. It's sort of like off. All right. So at some point when y'all are trying to get to the distribution center, do y'all miss the turn at uh, Dowdy Ferry? Yes, we did. And where did y'all end up having to turn around at? I think it was like Wintergreen. Okay, so and would Wintergreen be in this area here, where it said East Wintergreen? Yes. So you come further down 45 South, uh, exit is 273, and then y'all would loop back around, right? Yes, sir. And go back up, go back up till you get to the distribution center, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And this is basically what, what, what we see here, right? Going back up to the distribution center in this area. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, as far as the towers that they show, that you saw the state show, if you were in that area, would that explain why your phones were pinging in that area? I would assume so. Did you go to Wilmer that day? No. Um, other than going to 
that wintergreen on 45 and looping back up to go to the distribution center. Um, did you ever go to, what is it? Um, I think it was 36, 3600 Pulse Oak and drop a body off? No, sir. All right. Uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit more about the distribution center so the members of the jury will understand. Uh, again, this is a huge distribution center, right? Yes, it's when extremely you, large. When y'all get there, uh, do you have trouble finding somewhere to park? Nina did have trouble finding some place to park. There's a lot of folks that come and go from there. All right, and as far as that, was she trying to find somewhere to park up close at first? She was because obviously, like we generally do things together, but like I'm not walking any distance at all, so that's not happening. So at some point, she parked, tried to go in, or went in, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you didn't go in. No. Okay. At some point, uh, is she able to, to pick up the package? She went in, but I think we might have been late. I'm not sure, but she didn't get the package. Okay. Uh, after y'all leave that distribution center, do y'all, what do y'all do? We went back home. Okay. Uh, did she subsequently find a way to get her package? I'm assuming she did. Like, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming she did. Or managed to get the documents another way. Okay. Um, at any time while y'all were in the... <coughs> That Hutchins area. Did you have uh, Marcella with you? No. All right. All right. Let's let's get to talk about Charles Beltran some more. Uh, I think when we left off, we were talking about Charles the dog. Charles the dog. Okay. Uh, I want to talk to you about. Mr. Beltran um, working, did he actually work for your son? As I understand it, yes. He was a bouncer at the club. And at some point he got fired, didn't he? Yes, he did. For his activities there at the club, right? Yes, he did. Not just being aggressive with the women? No, not just that. Okay. Issues he was having with other patrons? He was fighting every night, and he was a bouncer. So he was getting into altercations and fights every night. And is this something he would brag to you and Nina about? Yes. No, I didn't, actually. Um, I didn't know what kind of convictions he had. He said that he had just gotten out of a halfway house. Okay. Um, what about the, the, the Santa Morta? Where did he say he got Santa Morta from? He did um, talk to me about Santa Morta and said that he had learned about it while he was in jail, and then he practiced. So he, he practiced the religion. And so the altar that we see in your home in Mesquite belonged to him, correct? It did. In fact, it's in the same, was that in his room or in the one of the other rooms? It's in the closet in his room from the picture. All right. And while we're on it, let's, let's talk about Pennsylvania and this uh, altar that's supposed to be in Pennsylvania. Can you explain to the members of the jury what that was all about? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, we listed this house for sale. Nina, being an attorney, had documents from private clients that she had that we had in a hall closet. It's a locked entryway closet, and there was a lock on it for a reason. The paperworks, paperwork and things that we had there were client attorney privileged. We didn't want that information out while the house was being shown. Her husband, Bill, had kind of a weird sense of humor. So in this closet, there was a, like a Halloween skeleton that's full size, like human sized. And he had put, because they were Mormon, a Mormon religious like piece of clothing on it. It's, it's like a, a long white robe. But it was bundled up in like on the floor of the closet. It's not anything else. So it was just a bunch of stuff and storage that we had in there that we kept locked. 
including paperwork that we didn't want shown to people coming to look at the house. Well, you heard that the neighbor from uh, Pennsylvania said y'all were kneeling in, kneeling to it, praying to it. Remember that? I remember her saying that, and I also have no concept why she would have said it. We never did that. Did that skeleton have anything to do with Santa Morta? Absolutely not. Okay. <coughs> okay, back to uh, Mr. Beltran. Um, now, you don't have any felony convictions, right? No. What you have some, uh, you have some like a theft check or something like that? There was um, two return checks to Costco that I didn't know anything about until I came here to Dallas on these charges, and they served me with those. So those return checks happened while I was in Pennsylvania. But those checks are out of Rockwall? They're out of Rockwall. Oh, and, and wasn't there something about a gun? What, what? Yes, a gun sir. At the airport? Yes. I had a, a very, very, very small antique handgun that was completely jammed. A bullet was jammed in the chamber. So wouldn't fire, wouldn't shoot. I took it to a gun shop that was really close to the house, but the gunsmith wasn't there. And I did it right before I was flying to see the kids that weekend. Forgot I had it. When I got to the airport, I realized the minute I was going through security, I was like, no, I have a gun in this purse. So I told them at the spot that I did. I was never actually arrested on that charge. Like, it was a situation where they told me if I had, like, a, a concealed carry permit, the gun wouldn't have been an issue. I could have taken it back out and put it in the locker or in the car and gone on the trip. But I was never actually arrested with that. I was stayed at an airport facility, and it was dismissed, and I left and went home. Okay, but I do want to ask you, Chuck did carry a gun, didn't he? All the time, every day, any place that he went. He moved in in August whenever the children moved out to the house in Florida. Uh, and I say moved in with you, I mean, you're not the only person he lived with, right? No. I mean, you knew he had an uh, apartment, right? Absolutely. Or an apartment that he also stayed with some other women. Absolutely. He stayed in a couple of different locations with women, I believe. But particularly one woman, uh, this Carmen, right? As I understood it, yes. And it wasn't just Carmen, there was other women at that place too. Yes, from what I understood. Um, so he moves in, you buy him all that studio equipment. Yes. That's true. Absolutely. He sets up a studio in your house. He does. Uh, and is he working at first? He did. He was extremely devoted to it. He kept um, a whiteboard on the wall. He had scheduled songs that he was doing, um, scheduled recording times. He had someone coming over to help him produce. So he was actually doing what he was supposed to do. He was trying to create music to actually put on iTunes and make money off of it. And were you investing in that? Yes. Uh, the video that um, I uh, forced the, the jury to watch, um, did you pay for that? Yes. I did. Uh, that video and the way he's acting on that video, is that Chuck? Yes, it is. All the time. That's not a show, right? That's, that's no. who he really is, isn't that it? That really is him. that studio and as far as him bringing women, were you jealous about him bringing women? Absolutely not. As far as him uh, bringing people to the house, did you ever have an argument with him about uh, having some men that you ran into in your own house? I did. Um, I came home one night from work at 7 o'clock and I didn't know anybody was there. So I went to my room, changed clothes, came in, and got surprised in the kitchen by a strange man who walked out. And Chuck wasn't there. Okay, and did that upset you? Very much so. Okay, Very did you let him so. know that? I did. Um, uh, I told him that I, I really didn't want anybody in the house unless he was there. 
particularly men, whenever I wouldn't know there was anybody in the house with me. So. Okay. But as far as these women, uh, you heard him say, hey, he brought women over there all the time. Is that true? He did. He would bring not one, sometimes two, three. And did guys some, sometimes come with them too? Absolutely. They'd be packed up in that studio, right? Absolutely. Uh, they were doing their thing, you were doing your thing? Yes. Um, oh, did he brag about pulling trains on people? He did. Now, what, what, is, what, what, is, what is pulling the train? Um, he particularly seemed to like having a friend of his, a male friend of his, come over to be with the girls that he brought home. So that's basically two guys and a girl. And they would brag, he would brag about it? Absolutely. But did that make you jealous? No. I want to fast forward to the early morning hours of uh, October 5th of 2020. Was Nina there? Yes. Were you and Nina there in your room asleep? Yes, with the dog. Um, on that day, did you ever come, come in contact with uh, Maricela? No. When Chuck arrived there with her, according to the phone records, mm -hmm. in the early morning hours, did you ever know he was there? No. Anything unusual about him arriving at your house in the early morning hours? No. You heard him say that uh, at some point you came into that room and you stabbed Morisell. Did you go into that room and stab Morisell? No. Did you struggle with Morisell? No, absolutely not. No. Did you argue with Chuck about Morisell? No. Had you ever met Morisell? No. In reference to. Um, This whole Chuck Marcella ordeal, how did you find out about it? I found out about it whenever the FBI agent showed up and called me on the phone. Okay, now before that, um, had you gone into Chuck's room and cleaned his room up? No. So as far as whatever blood was in there, who cleaned that blood up, you have no idea? I have no idea. You just know it wasn't you? I know I wasn't, no. I didn't go in the room, I no. It wasn't me. Okay, it wasn't Nina. It wasn't Nina. On that night, you don't know how many people he had in that room, do you? I have no idea. The next morning, did you ever come in contact with Morisella? No. Did you come in contact with Chuck? No. At some point, he leaves the, or at some point, you, you start driving the hours, right? Yes. Because on the, the night of October the 5th, or the early morning hours of October the 5th, who's in the hours? Chuck. Uh, that next day, who was in the hours? Chuck. All right, you heard the FBI agents say that uh, they came to talk to you. Right. All right. You tell the members of the jury what you remember. Um, they apparently came to my house. I was at work. I was working. So I got a phone call from an agent that claimed he was an FBI agent while I was on the clock at work. So I talked to him there. Um, his conversation with me was basically... Um, do you know Chuck Beltran, or Charles Beltran, I think was what he said. And I was like, yes, I do. How do you know him? He lives at the residence with me, so he lives there. Now, let me stop you there. Up to this point, do you know anything about some missing girl from Seattle? No. you know anything about Charles Beltran uh, being the last person seen with Marcel? No, I had no clue. All right, then what happened? So I told him uh, who he was, that he lived there. 
The agent didn't go into a whole lot of detail. He said something to the effect that he was the last person seen with a girl who was missing. And that was pretty much the gist of it. He asked me the last time I had seen him, which I think I told him it had been about two weeks, because at that point it kind of had been that long. So um, he asked me that. He told me when I spoke to him to let him know that he was looking for him, which I did promptly. I told him that. So after you talked to the agent, you immediately called him? I called him. I said there was an FBI agent that showed up at the house who called me and said that he's looking for you. Here's who it is. That's pretty much what was said. Okay. Um, did Charles go into detail about Marcel at that time? No, he did not elaborate. He didn't say anything else about it. He was like, okay, he took the number, supposedly, and that was that. Did he seem worried at all? No, not even a little. Not a concern in the world? No. That the FBI were looking for him? No. I do want to kind of backtrack. Uh, at some point, we talked about Beltron Charles being in the car uh, on October the 5th. At some point, did you drop Nina off at the airport in that vehicle? Yes. I How did that take place? I think her flight left on that Wednesday. And whenever I got up to take her to the airport, and then I was going back to work that day because I hadn't worked Monday or Tuesday. So when I went out to the garage, the Audi was there and my Hyundai was gone. So I, I took the Audi and drove to the airport and went to work. All right, just so the members of the jury know, that's really nothing unusual, right? No, it did, wasn't. Um, did he have keys to both vehicles? Yes. All right. And you put gas in it, he'd run it out? Bring it, drop it off, I'd have another one. And he would do that while I was at the office, too. I would not see Chuck. I would just go out from the office and a different car would be parked in the spot. So. And did that create problems for you at the office as far as your what, your, your, your files and your documentation? Yes, because... Explain that to the members of the jury. Yeah, whenever you go home and you work from the office, like sometimes I would need the actual hard physical file. I couldn't just access it by online application to the office file. So I would take the physical file with me. So they would typically be in the back of my Tucson. So I could get them or I would take them back to work and they would be in the car. So when he would change these vehicles or leave with my vehicle and I couldn't get to it and I had a file in the car, that's a real issue because they're active files and something that's being worked on every day. That can cause me to get fired. So him taking the vehicle and me not able to get a hold of him or him trade it back or me being able to get to that was a serious issue for me. And you saw the phone records earlier showing that you kept trying to contact them? Yes, sir. Do you think that's what that was about? I'm pretty sure that's what that was about. Okay. Did Charles ever tell you uh, what happened to Marcel? No. What did he even talk about? No. I'm saying even after y'all realized that, that he was wanted, you were wanted, what did he talk about? No. And I, I didn't know I was wanted until... Okay, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. As far as, um, after you talked to this FBI agent, right? Yes, sir. Um, did somehow your address end up on the social media? Immediately, that same day. What problems did that create for you? It was havoc. Um, that very day that he called me, that night I was at home. And I got a text message from someone claiming to be an FBI agent. It was very threatening. It was, I know you know where Chuck is. You need to have him here at such and such a time, such and such a day. Extremely aggressive. So, I, I mean, it really kind of throws you off. Like, I don't know who this person is. I actually texted this person back and I said, if you will send me a picture of your badge like your, your badge, your badge number, then I, I will communicate with you. Never heard another thing. What other issues thing. did you have after um, your address went viral? Um, while I was stuck with the Audi and hadn't been able to get the Tucson back, somebody slashed the tires while I was driving it. So it was, it was really kind of aggressive. Like 
I was getting strange phone calls too. Like it, it was out there. A, a full picture of the house was out there. It was not safe at all in any way, shape, or form. I had no idea who knew that, who who Chuck even had around him that was going to be coming where I was. Okay, and you, you felt like um, all this threatening attention was coming from, from who? I felt like it was Chuck and Chuck's friends, Chuck's people, Chuck's surrounding people around him. And what about the people that were concerned with uh, Marcel? I'm sorry? Was there a lot of uh, social media stuff? Absolutely. It was everywhere. As far as I know, it was everywhere. So your, the fact that, I guess, your home, where you live, was on social media? Absolutely. And that gave you concern? Very much so. Safety concerns? Very much so. Um, at some point, will you tell the members of the jury why you uh, quit your job and went to Florida? Um, we had intended to go to Florida, but I didn't go to Florida first. Like, we still had the house in Pennsylvania. Okay. So, I mean, this was emotionally very, very, very stressful. Having my house out there, having people contacting me, the tires being slashed, I'm by myself in Texas. Like, I, I'm still, like, my legs are a nightmare and a disaster. Like, I'm still trying to recover. It was awful trying to be here by myself and deal with that. Okay, so did you end up going to Pennsylvania when Nina was? I did. Nina and I had already planned that in January of that next year that we were going to move to the same location anyway. Like it depended on how the house sold as to whether we would go into Pennsylvania or to Florida. Well, but you, you saw the state uh, had a document saying you had just signed a lease. I did sign a lease because I wasn't leaving until January and the lease was up on October the 1st. I didn't want to move furniture or do any of that, so signing the lease was the best solution. Nina and I talked about it, and I went ahead and signed it just so that we would have those three months from October until January for me to be able to, you know, finish out because there were a couple of larger cases that I was trying to resolve for the bonus before I left. All right. Now, as far as um, when did y'all actually put the house up for sale in, in Pennsylvania, if you remember? Um, I don't remember exactly when we signed the listing because the house had so much repair to have done. Like we borrowed the money around. Um, well, how much money did y'all borrow? Hundred thousand. And that was for repairs on the house. For repairs on the house, it needed a new roof, it needed a new foundation, and it needed a whole new deck on the back. Okay, did y'all? All that. We did. We did affect all those repairs. Oh, and we had to tear down like a, a small like barn out building too, so we had to pay for that. All right. And did that increase the value of the house? Yes, it surely did. Um, you hear, I guess everyone's saying y'all were in a rush to sell the house. Um, we wanted to sell it and we wanted that income because we wanted to buy a place in Miami because that's where we wanted to live and that's why we needed the money. That was the goal. Um, y'all needed the money to have anything to do with y'all being on the run? Absolutely not. Okay. At some point, did y'all sell the house in Pennsylvania? We did. Then what happened? Um, well, we had already moved and relocated to Florida. So we were, I was working in Hollywood, which is like a little outside area of Miami. So we started to look for a house or property. And we also considered the concept of opening a, a bar in the Miami area and Kyle actually managing it for us. So we were looking at a couple of different thoughts. Okay, well let's backtrack. How did um, Charles Beltran end up in uh, Pennsylvania? Um, he knew about the property. He knew that we had the house in Pennsylvania. He knew that we had listed it on the market. So he knew where this house was. So we're in Pennsylvania. We had not actually talked to him. He ended up in Bethlehem, which is just outside of East Stroudsburg where the house was. He called us and told us that he was there. So y'all didn't send for him? No. He just showed up? He just showed up. When he showed up, 
Well, did he ask you questions about the house? He wanted to know if the house had sold. Obviously, he was after the money. He wanted to know if the house had sold. He wanted to know where we were in the house sale. Okay, but uh, why are you putting up with Charles Beltran? Charles was a lot more aggressive than what you have been told. He was really bad as far as aggression goes. Um, one night in particular, he was trying to get a hold of me for money. Whenever I woke up in the morning, I had 99 missed phone calls from this man. 99. And he also, at one point, like, I had locked the door. He, his access into the house was through the garage door because he would come in through the garage. There's a, a door that went between the kitchen and the garage. So I locked that door. He didn't have a key to it. It really made him mad. When I got home that night, the door was broken. Like the actual door itself was split, the door. And he broke the frame to the point where you couldn't fix the latch on the door. So that was how mad and aggressive he was. Okay, so you hear all these women talk about how sweet he was. Is that the 50-50 you're referring to? Well, it's not the 50 I got most of the time in the later days, but he could definitely appear to be. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, let me ask you this. As far as, um, even after y'all found out he was a person of interest, why did y'all keep, um, why did you keep? I'm sorry, he was a what? After you found out, when did you find out he was a person of interest that the police wanted to talk to you? Um, on that, on that 13th phone call from the FBI. Okay, all right. Um, okay, at some point y'all go to Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, does he end up in Miami? He did end up in Miami, yes. Um, he pretty much, like, we had to go get him in Mexico. So when we came back from Mexico, Nina and I were already in between the move because we were in a contract on the house in Pennsylvania. Okay, let's, let's talk about Mexico. Why did y'all go to Mexico? Was that y'all's idea or his? Yes. Chuck wanted to go to Mexico. Chuck so wants something, y'all make it happen. We made it happen because I didn't trust that I would not end up like Miss Patello okay. and Nina, like both of us, or our families for that matter. So you did what Chuck asked you to do? Absolutely. At some point, I want to go ahead and talk about when y'all find out, well, when Nina gets arrested, y'all already set up in, in Florida, right? Yes. You already got your business plan? Trying to relocate. Yes. Uh, you heard the agent say that uh, you were there the day she got arrested. Is that correct? Yes. Tell him to the jury what happened. Um, Nina had sent me a text that led me to believe that she was either in the process of being arrested or arrested. My concern was us being able to have enough time for me to get an attorney, attorneys lined up for us, for us to be able to get something prepared before both of us were arrested and likely not to be able to do that. And is that what you did? That's exactly what I did. You got out of there? Yes. And eventually you got arrested? I did. When you got arrested, you saw the video, right? I did. Were you on the phone with, with the lawyer? At that time, it sure was. In fact, this lawyer right here? Yes. Um, again, trying to make arrangements for you and Nina. Yes. I think you indicated that you actually even sent a uh, lawyer in Florida to try to help her. I did. I was extremely concerned about Nina's mental health from this. Okay, let me ask you, why, why were you concerned with Nina's mental health? Um, Nina's an attorney. Nina has spent an incredible amount of her time to be an attorney. She is actually a Cambridge scholar. So Nina really has invested everything into this. This case, in and of itself, has destroyed us. The fact that they have brought this charge against me and Nina has ruined our lives. But ma'am, what I'm asking you about was when Nina was in jail in Florida, did she try to commit suicide? She was, on, on suicide watch? she was on suicide watch because of these things, because of this. 
So yes. And so when you see the text messages and you're saying you're holding him to keep her shit together, is that what you're referring to? Yes. I, I did not want her to, to have a meltdown and try to commit suicide or effectively be able to do that. And I wanted her to have the knowledge that, you know, it's it's okay. I've got defense lined up for us. I've got things started. It's, you know, it'll be okay. okay. Um, you, I, I just don't want to make sure I don't, I don't forget because these girls that were at the apartment that uh, Chuck also resided at, uh, did you tell me, or what, what, did you say anything about uh, him potentially being involved in trafficking? I had suspicion that Chuck was involved with trafficking. Why? Because <coughs> on a couple of occasions, like two separate ones that I can think of in particular, I found a suitcase at the house that was like in, in the living room area. It was just like a, a carry-on. And I, I looked like I looked to see what it was, and it was full of young girls' clothing. It was small sizes, young girls' clothing. Okay. All right. Um, after you got arrested, when did you uh, first find out about that you were being charged with capital murder? At the arrest in Florida, the arresting officer told me it was capital murder of a police officer and terroristic threatening. Okay, did you know what any of that means? No. Um, at some point, were you, um, were you uh, transferred back here to Dallas? Yes. And you as well? Yes. You're being held on a capital murder warrant. Yes. At that time, as far as uh, Mrs. Mrs. Patillo's uh, disappearance, did you know that they were alleging that you stabbed her? No. Not until I got here to Texas. That's the first time you found out that they were alleging that Charles was alleging that you stabbed Mrs. Patello. Yes. Did you stab Morissette? Absolutely not. Did you have any reason to stab Morissette? Absolutely not. Did you have some anger crazed? breakdown because you were so obsessed with, with, with Charles? Absolutely not. So you find out that you've been charged with, um, that they're alleging that, that, that you stabbed Marcel and Nina Help, right? That's what that I was the allegation, correct? That's, yes, so that's both y'all charged. Yep. Start going through the process. Yes. Eventually bond out. <coughs> yes. You get the leg bond. Yes. Um, while you're on bond and, and you have the leg monitors, are you and Nina still living together? Yes. Got an apartment. We got a house. Got a house. All right. Uh, once you're in this house, does any specific, uh, specific <laughs> suspicious activities start taking place? Yes. Um, the entire well, actually, it was the entire time that we were out on house arrest. People were people were posting things about us that they saw us in the actual location. Like people were following us. People were paying attention to where we're going. So we were constantly underneath some kind of scrutiny by social media, by people who were following the case. Like, we never had any rest from that. They were always... In fact, 
it got so bad, did y'all actually try to do a cease and desist? We did. We absolutely did. Tell the juror what that means. Uh, a cease and desist is whenever you send a notification that they must cease and desist from publishing or doing anything against you or in your name because it was absolutely not correct or true. It was, uh, it was just made up things that were so derogatory it was affecting everything. So we did do a cease and desist on it. And did you feel as though it was putting you in danger? Absolutely. Were no question. Correct? Yes. Um, and then as far as the, uh, well, what, what I'm getting at is, at some point y'all got those monitors up. We did. Tell them about the jury why. We cut the monitors off because we both felt very much persecuted in this case. I, I do as I'm sitting here in front of you today. I feel very much like Nina and I have been completely singled out in this case in a way that should not have been. Like you consider, I was 57 years old when this incident happened. I did nothing but work and raise children all my life. There's, I mean, why would I even be suspicious in this? I've never been arrested. I had no criminal record. Nina's an attorney. She had never had any kind of criminal record. Like, we lived a life that was pretty much outstanding. We hadn't ever done anything like this. Well, this let me ask you. Okay, you said you felt persecuted. Yes. Is that why, why, or why Cambodia? Cambodia was a good place for asylum. Cambodia was a good place for us to find a new life, for us to live, for us not to have these situations. Um, we looked at it. We looked at citizenship. We entered Cambodia legally. We didn't do anything illegal. We did everything you were supposed to do to come into a new country and try to nationalize or to get asylum there. Okay, and you were trying to get asylum because you felt persecuted? Absolutely. And were you afraid? Yes, absolutely, both. For your safety? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, at the time, right before we left and flew out, there was a black pickup truck that had started to park right outside of our house. And it would move on the street, but it was always there. One day, I went to the window, me and Nina were cooking in the kitchen, and this black truck is parked right outside our kitchen window. Whenever he saw us, he left. But it was definitely a man, and it was nobody we knew personally, and somebody that shouldn't have been there. And did that give you concern? Absolutely. So when you went to Cambodia, did you just go out of necessity? Yes. In, in our feelings, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I've always worked. Okay. In, in fact, did you get a job offer? I did. While you were on the next one? I did. So it's going to help pay for your legal expenses? I did, yes. And what happened with the job? Um, I got the job fairly quickly whenever we got out. My resume is really clean. So I got this position with the law firm. Um, he tendered an offer to me, which I accepted. With this leg monitor program, you have to get approval for everything you do, and you heard. When you, when you say approval, you gotta get approval from the judge, right? I do, yes, you, anything you do. So, I, I let my attorneys know that I had a job offer. They had to file a motion with a hearing before this judge to get this approved. There's a limited period of time, of course, because I had to start within a certain time range. I had given enough time for me my start date to give me like a week or about that for the judge to give approval for me to do this the right way. The minute the motion was filed and it was, you know, known by the prosecution, by by the court system, that I had a job and that it was with this firm, the offer was rescinded before the hearing could even take place. Okay. So it was affecting your, your ability to, to work? It would have been, an, it, it, it was an impossibility. Every time I would get an interview or try to get an interview, the time frame for me being able to get to that interview was impossible. 
And you didn't think that was coincidence, did you? No, I definitely did not. Is that why you kind of felt like y'all were being persecuted? Yes, one of the reasons. Is that Charles Beltran? It is. And is that the uh, Santa Marta uh, case that he had? Yes. And uh, does this photo have significance to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much an indicator that he and his people are watching. Judge Oliver, what's marked as uh, defense 13? No objection, Your Honor. Defendant's exhibit uh, 13 is admitted for all purposes. Again, this is the little Santa Morta emblem, correct? Yes. And this is uh, Charles Beltran, right? Yes. And he's telling you that we're, we're always watching. Yes. <coughs> is that Was that threatening to you? Very. Did you believe that he and his people were always watching? Yes. Is that why you went to Cambodia? Yes. Is that why you continue to send him money? Yes. To stay in contact with him. Yes. I've got some witnesses. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so, Ms. Dykes, um, you said you've been a paralegal for how long? 33 years. 33 years. And all in negotiations, right? No, not all in negotiation. I've done personal injury. I'm primarily a litigation paralegal, so okay. negotiation is not something I've always done. Well, you did negotiations here in Dallas, didn't you? I, I did for part of the time that I was with that firm. And you're no stranger to the courtroom. I mean, you know how, how things work. Uh, you've been, been in the courtroom in your job for a long time. Is that right? Yes. And uh, the soft-spoken uh, Ms. Dykes that you are today, I mean, as far as negotiation, you're negotiating big cases. These aren't like little baby cases. I mean, these are important things, right? Technically, I didn't negotiate the big cases. I worked the big cases as far as litigation aspects go. Okay, but you're talking to attorneys, you're talking to other um, negotiators, you're talking to companies about um, you know, their money and things like that. Is that right? Yes. And you have to be uh, fairly strong in, in your negotiations to get the job done. And you did get the job done, didn't you? You have to know the files. Uh, yeah, but you have done. to be strong in your negotiation to get the job done, right? You mm -hmm. can't just fall over at the first offer and say, okay, I give up, right? I you have to know what you're doing and you have to be strong. I think you have to be clear and concise. Okay. And um, as far as, um, again, you know enough about the legal field. You know enough about... Um, you know, what goes on in a courtroom to kind of understand uh, some of the procedures, right? I do. Okay. So, just a minute. I mean, you mentioned um, all these threatening things, and you were advised if there was anything that went wrong or anything else like that, you could either talk to Julian LaPere, your uh, ELM person, and you could talk to uh, the judge about what was going on, and you never did that, did you? No. Okay, so you never told him about any of these issues that you had going on supposedly during your time on ELM, right? You're a smart enough woman to know you could have told them any of that and they would have done whatever they could to make you feel better, right? Which issues are you speaking I, of? I'm talking about this truck that's outside. I'm talking about uh, the people uh, supposedly harassing you. You could have talked to the judge about that, right? I feel that would have probably been ineffective. But you didn't try, did you? No. And you didn't tell Miss LaPere about any of that, did you? 
No, she knew about the work problems. Okay. And that was it, right? That was the only problem that you really talked to her about, right? Yes. And you're making the, uh, this jury believe, I, I think, that you think the prosecution has something to do with you not getting the job, right? I do believe that. Okay, and you understand, Ms. Dux, we don't have that kind of time. I mean, if you don't know that, we don't have that kind of time. I don't know what kind of time you have and you don't, ma'am, honestly. Um, now, as far as uh, Ms. LaPere is concerned, she was here earlier. Your, your counsel had a, a opportunity to ask her questions about that situation, didn't he? He did. Okay. And um, Ms. LaPere, she didn't say anything about notifying or having to notify the prosecution or the court at every request that you make, right? She did go over what you can and can't do while you're on ELN. She also did, I believe, testify to the fact that you had to have approval to work. Okay. Now, I'm looking through all this stuff here, and uh, you were talking about uh, all these people that are harassing you and, and causing problems, and even before, uh, back in uh, 2020, before this incident happened, you know, all these terrible things that happened to you, and I, I can't seem to find a police report where you reported this stuff. You where, didn't do that, did you? Where I reported what? Uh, these problems that you were having, these people that are harassing you, these calls that, that you're getting. You didn't report any of that to the police, did you? To be frank, ma'am, I don't trust police at this point in my life. Well, at that time, you had no reason to, did you? In 20? It, before you even knew that there was a, uh, that people were that the police were looking for you and trying to contact you, you had no reason to distrust police at that time. The incidents that we're speaking of started to happen when the FBI agent showed up at the door on 1013. And there was nothing about that contact that would make you distrust police at that time, was it? At the time that they were there? At the time that the FBI contacted you on October 15th, you had no reason to distrust police. The text that night that I got from a gentleman claiming to be an FBI officer is pretty alarming. If he was an FBI officer, which I have no idea of knowing whether he was or not, that makes you start to distrust. Well, he's just stated on direct that uh, you asked for a, a picture of his badge and he didn't send you one. He didn't. And so at that point, I mean, you knew he wasn't legit, right? Not really. Like okay. the fact I that mean, he, Taylor Page rang your doorbell, stood in front of the ring camera. You've seen that. That's how ring cameras work. When the, when the doorbell rings, you have an app on your phone, and you can see that video, right? No, I never saw the app. I never now, I'm saw I'm asking you, is that how the ring camera works? Uh, I didn't have the app, and it was Chuck's ring camera. So I didn't have any of that. So uh, speaking of Chuck, you mentioned, uh, I mean, you, you made it a point right off the bat to talk about how violent he was. Again, I'm looking through all of this stuff, and I don't see one police report that you called in on Chuck the entire time that you all lived together. You I mean, didn't do that, did you? I would not have. I would not dare to have done that. He is not the kind of man you make a police report on and, and have anything come of that that's good. Okay, so he's not the kind of man, I mean, if he does something in your home that you invited him into, that you put him up in, that you bought him all that equipment, that you bought him that car, that you paid for all his shoes and his clothing and things like that, he's not the kind of man that you could call and report him to the police and he could arrest him and be out of your life. That's, yeah. that's how simple it was, right? It was not that simple. Chuck was now, not the kind of guy to... Now, talk about Chuck's friends. Uh, Dax, Freddie, you know them, right? I do know them through the They've been to your house plenty of times, right? They have. Okay, and, and I mean, they talked about how everybody knew, everybody knew that you were in a relationship with Chuck, right? They talked about that. They said that, yes. Okay, and so it was common knowledge that this arrangement between you and Chuck really didn't have much at all to do with this rap career, if anything, because we saw Defense Exhibit 7, and any woman that is trying to save her retirement and save up and make a smart financial decisions is not going to feed money into that man and that kind of rap and that kind of video after she saw what was produced. That, that doesn't make any sense, does it? His first 
um, productions out of Austin, as I had said. Were Ma'am, much I'm asking about this yeah, production. Yes, she be allowed to ask the question, answer the question. I mean, I understand it on cross, but. Sustained. The, and my question to you is, after seeing what he produced on Defendant's Exhibit 7, uh, picture me this, where the lyrics are lickety dick and lickety lick, no woman trying to save her retirement is going to continue to invest in that, correct? That's my question to you. They may. If, if there's a potential for improvement, if there's a potential for it to change, to reflect what the actual work that was done before, is produced, then yes, they might. Stay you're trying to save for retirement, aren't you? I'm trying to build a, an income stream that would sustain me through later years. Now, as far as um, the court proceedings go, as far as the court proceedings go, I mean, you bonded out in, uh, I believe, May of uh, 2021, is that right? Yes. Okay, and, and Nina got out first, and you got out, and you, you all were able to get a nice little house together and uh, live together on, on ELM. And it wasn't great, but it wasn't that bad, was it? No, it was pretty bad. Okay, and um, looking at the past slips, um, Showing was when Mark states 398 through 402, and it starts with uh, 402. That's your signature right there, is that correct? Yes. If you'll just look through each of those, and do those look like the past slips in your case from the time you bought it out to the time you came again? Now, Your Honor, uh, state offer states uh, 398 three, uh, through 402 for all purposes. No objection, Judge. Uh, starting in September, hold on. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. 398 through 402. Yes, Your Honor. Are admitted for all purposes. Okay, permission to publish. Excuse me. Uh, looking at states 402, um, this is September 21st. You signed that pass slip, and it just says discovery needed, right? Mm -hmm. You were here for yeah, a sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, you were. You didn't talk to anybody, any prosecutors. You didn't have to go to the courtroom. You just talked to your attorney, and you left. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Stays 398, October 1st, 2021. Your signature's not even there, is it? No. You didn't have to even show up in court, right? I don't think so. I don't recall exactly, but I don't think so. Okay, but you would have signed it if you had to show up, right? Possibly. Okay, uh, October 29th, 2021, again, your signature's not there, right? Right, yes. So, so uh, you didn't sign that pass slip either. Uh, November 29th, 2021, you didn't sign that pass slip, and that's in States 400. Yes. And then uh, on... December 29th, 2021, you're actually in Cambodia at this time, right? No, that's November 29th, 2021. Okay, but it's reset to um, 
December 29, 2021. Is that correct? It was reset to that day. But the day of that signature was November 29th, 2021. Okay, and you didn't have to sign that day either, right? No. So you're not having to spend any time up here? No. Yes. In fact, the one that's right there on your wrist, if you'll show that to the jury, please, the, the you, uh, Your Honor may, Ms. Dykes, uh, stand up um, and present to her tattoo to the jury. Well, she may stand up where she is and okay. show her tattoo. And we're talking about the one right there on your wrist, right? Mm -hmm. This one right there. Right. You're aware that Chuck has that same tattoo, doesn't he? He does. Yes, he does. Okay. So you are a 57-year-old woman investing in a rapper's career. Um, you don't have any personal relationship at all, but you get a matching tattoo. The tattoo is actually the logo for the business that I started for him that I'm invested in, math class. That's what the tattoo is. And it's the logo for that. Now, you and Nina are really close, aren't you? Yes. You know pretty much everything about each other, right? Yes, I would think. Um, she talked to you while she was in Pennsylvania? We've consistently kept a relationship for 16 years. Okay, so she talks, you, you guys talk all the time? We do. Now, uh, you mentioned that Bill didn't live there, but if Bill didn't live in Pennsylvania, why is he keeping Halloween decorations there? That doesn't make any sense, does it? No, that's not exactly what I said. They had a house together in Staten Island where they actually resided. This house is a house where they were repairing the house to sell it as a couple or to live in it as they chose to do. Um, they did have personal property there from both of them. This Miss Scarpa just made up this fact that you guys uh, knelt there, right? Miss Scarpa had said what she said for whatever reason she did, but it was not true. Okay. And uh, Olivia Martinez, I'll say Rodriguez again, <clears throat> Olivia Martinez, she was uh, somebody that you were training, right? She was someone I trained, yes. And you guys uh, kept the same office, didn't you? She was put into my office so that I could train her. Okay, so you guys shared an office, didn't you? Yes. And uh, as anybody that shares an office, you guys get in personal uh, conversations, right? Olivia liked to listen to my phone calls. As far as personal Objection, conversations go, uh, no. Your Honor. If you could sustain, you need to listen to the specific question and answer that specific question if you can. Uh, if you don't know, then just say you don't know. Okay. Um, you may proceed. Thank you. Ms. Dykes, being in the same office with someone, you get in some personal conversations, don't you? Not always, no. Okay, but you did have some personal some conversations with Olivia, didn't you? About certain things. Okay. And uh, you talk to her about <coughs> Chuck sometimes, right? Honestly, no. I didn't talk to Olivia about Chuck. You never talked to her about Chuck? No. Okay, did you, you never talked to her about Nina either, did you? No, actually Nina, she met coming into the office. Nina used to come and sit with me in the office. Okay, and you know that she testified that you all had several personal conversations at work. You recall that conversation? Right? I remember her testimony. Okay, so there's a person number two that's lying, right? Seems to be Olivia had some thoughts that weren't exactly correct. Okay, and um, Kat De Leon, she's a, she's a hairdresser. You went to her for years, didn't you? I did. And you guys were close, weren't you? No, she was my hairdresser. Okay, and as a hairdresser, uh, you know the gig. I mean, you stick with the same hairdresser for a while. They know your styles, they know your fashions, they know the things you like, right? Should, yes. Okay, and she was a good hairdresser, wasn't she? She was good with color, yes. Okay. And she was good with cuts too, wasn't she? Not so much. Then why'd she keep going? Because she was good with color. Okay. Um, but she still cut her hair too, didn't she? She did, yes. Okay. And uh, she was so good that you took Chelsea there too, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Um, 
You didn't have any personal conversations with Kat either, did you? We did have personal conversations. We so sure you did. told her about Chuck? Uh, I did tell her that Chuck was there in the house, yes. Okay, and you told her about your, you talked about him all the time, didn't you? No, not all the time. Uh, you talked about him frequently to her, didn't you? When she asked, I answered her. And of course, if he was this mean, awful, violent person, you could have told her that. You would have told her that. Not necessarily. But you told her about the sex, didn't you? No, I didn't. You didn't tell her anything about you guys having uh, any kind of sexual relationship? No, I didn't, because that wouldn't be true. Nita spent quite a bit of time after Bill died in Pennsylvania by herself, right? I don't remember exactly how long she was there. Um, she first, whenever, yeah, when Bill died, she was in Pennsylvania, yes. Okay, so that was November. You guys actually started taking trips and things together um, on a fairly regular basis uh, in maybe the summer of 2019, does that sound about right? No, I think that's too soon. October 2019? Um, yeah, probably. Okay, and then he passes in, uh, and that's when you guys really kind of started going from being best friends to taking this to a different level, right? Nina and I still to this day are best friends, so the commitment to actually marry didn't come until April or May. I'm not 20. talking about marriage mistakes. I'm talking about where you all start discussing and making a decision that this isn't just a best friend buddy situation, that we're going to be in a, a different type of relationship. That happened um, around October 2019, is that right? I think that's way too soon. Okay. It wasn't but if you better. told Kat DeLeon that it was October 2019, um, that's mistaken? I think Kat's probably off on that, because okay. we really didn't start even remotely thinking about anything like that until 20. Uh, Bill passes in 2019, is that correct? I really don't remember, I think so. November 2019, right? I believe so. And you and Lisa, I'm sorry, you and Nina, um, y'all start getting closer and closer. Is that fair to say? Yes, she was going through a lot of things. I mean, we were already extremely, extremely close, but her suffering from Bill dying was pretty extraordinary, so yes. Okay, and, and you knew about some of her relationships too, is that right? I did. You knew that she was uh, having a relationship with a guy in uh, Pennsylvania. I can't recall his name, but you remember that he was, she was having a relationship with a guy in Pennsylvania. Um, no, she didn't really have a relationship with anybody in Pennsylvania. She uh, yeah. saw somebody maybe in Pennsylvania, but not a relationship. Okay, relationship might be a little uh, more than what it was, but she was texting a guy, and she saw a guy, and they had sex. Uh, while she was in Pennsylvania, is that? I, I think so, yes. And uh, you know that, I mean, she texts this guy and she told all, that guy all about you, her fiance, and all about Chuck the third. I don't know, I never saw anything like that. It was clear that you guys were open about what the deal was. You and Nina were married and Chuck was your, your, your guy. No, he wasn't. Concerned. Kyle lives here in Dallas, doesn't he? Yes. And uh, he was uh, the, I guess, manager of the bar? Is he that was. Right? Yes. Uh, on premise? Yes. And he actually hired Chuck, is that right? Yes. And Dax also worked there, is that correct? Dax was working as a bouncer at that time. And Chuck was a doorman? Yeah, well, he was a bouncer too. They were both working in the same position. Um, that's how you met Chuck, through your son Kyle, is that correct? Yes. You mentioned to the jury that uh, Chuck got, and it, Kyle cares a whole lot about you, doesn't he? I, I believe so, yes. He's I mean, you son. guys uh, still, to this day, you all talk all the time, right? We do. And uh, he'll pretty much do anything for you, is that correct? I, 
don't know. I haven't got any new cl- new clothes for court yet, so I can't really say that. No. Well, that, that's because he'd have to appear here in the court building to get you those clothes, right? That's not true. I mean, you told him to stay away, didn't you? No. You didn't tell him to stay away? No. Well, I have, like, not wanted him to be up here because of the risk for him and the, the danger of being around all these people.
guess it 